the mightiest hero of black. Description Cheyenne, the hero of darkness. He was said to be the strongest hero ever. He believed one thing, and that was his current party members. I'll defeat the demon lord with this party. That is what he swore to do, but a tragedy occurs. He was painfully betrayed by the girls that he trusted. He barely held on to his life, but the incident left a deep scar in his heart. He gave up on living, and while he was wandering around in a forest, looking for a way to die, a single monster appeared in front of him. Will you kill me, please? The monster asked Cheyenne, who was still strong, despite losing his powers. What Cheyenne, who wanted to die as well, did was. Chapter 1 The Hero of Darkness, Falling into Darkness I'm going to say it, I've always loved you Cheyenne. I if you're fine with someone like me, can you go out with me? On a night of a full moon, my party's healer Emily confessed to me in the shadow of a rock bed. Wham. Well, I, but. Being so flustered as a grown man is quite embarrassing. I'm almost 25, so I do somewhat have immunity to women. But the reason why I'm shaken is because recently, my party's magician, Luna, and swordsman, Lamia, had also confessed to me. You're an important friend and party member. But I'm not sure if I think of you like that. Am I, not attractive? That's not true. You're clean and pretty. You're really attractive. Then can you put your answer on hold? Please tell me your answer, after we defeat the demon lord. As I watched her walk away with a cute, broad smile on her face, my heart was beating so hard it felt like it was going to burst. What do I do? Now I have three cases on hold. My face broke into a smile under my mask even as I was lost in thought. There are three people that love me. There's no way I wouldn't be happy. There are always sixteen heroes in this world. They are divided into two types, element heroes and sacred heroes. The former is excellent with elements such as fire or light, while the latter have special powers such as divine eye or divine speed. The day I became the hero of darkness was thirteen years ago. There were happy times as well as hard times, and after many twists and turns, I'm with my current party. Cheyenne, it's a poison slime. Leave it to me. We face plenty of monsters on our journey to defeat the demon lord. Today's first battle was against a slime that is immune to physical attacks. Luna, our magician, shot flames from her staff and burned the poison-colored slime. It was powerful, but unfortunately the enemy was still lively. This enemy is annoying to deal with because their weaknesses change depending on the individual. Your weakness isn't fire, I see. How about this? Luna then tried using water and wind, the other types of magic she could use. None of her attacks hit. While Luna was starting to panic, our magic swordsman, Lamia, draped electricity around her sword. Stay back Luna. I'll take care of this. What do you mean? You're just trying to show off to Cheyenne. Poison slimes are weak to either fire, water, wind, earth, or thunder. Most of the time it's lightning. Which means it's difficult for you, since you can't use thunder element. Humph. Luna pouted, and Lamia gave me a wink after slashing through the slime. No, it was ineffective yet again. Ugh, don't tell me its weakness is earth. Lamia looked beaten. None of us had affinity for earth element. Wait, let me handle this. A black ball appeared in front of my eyes. It's called Darkness Sphere and it's a skill that absorbs the enemy's magic. But its real ability is to stock up the magic it absorbed and activate, reflect, it whenever I want to. Rumble rumble. Dirt rose up on both sides of the slime. They slammed together and killed it instantly. I incredible. That's Cheyenne for you. Good job again today, Cheyenne. I was just lucky. Let's work hard together again today, all four of us. In the past I hated journeying as a hero, but when we formed this party three years ago, every day has been fun. I'm thankful to them from the bottom of my heart that they had changed my life. We took a break next to the road at noon. Luna muttered gloomily. What, are we? We're party members, but Cheyenne is so strong, we have nothing to do. Lamia and Emily continued painfully. I'm no match for Cheyenne, both with the sword and magic. 
I haven't saved him even once during battle. I've only used healing magic on Cheyenne once. And that was just a scrape too. I regret letting them be worried. I don't mean to brag, but I'm the strongest in this party. But I should have relied on them more, since they are my party members. Wait, you guys are really helpful when we are facing a lot of enemies at once. Not only during battle, you help me mentally as well. Heroes are praised, but there are unpleasant things as well. Even if you go save a village from monsters, people say things like why couldn't you come sooner? My dad died, stupid hero. There are also many people who try to make use of me. All these things built up and I couldn't bring myself to like people anymore, and before I knew it, I was wearing a mask to cover my face. But the girl's warm words and attitudes had saved me many times. If you guys weren't with me, I would have stopped being a hero long ago. So please, don't make such faces. S. Sorry Cheyenne. I was just kind of nervous. Same here. I'll train even more and be useful someday. Let's get through this together. Thanks. Let's continue our journey. The four of us could get through any hardships. That's what I believe. We're the best party, after all. Anyways, why don't we move separately from here? Let's meet up at the inn in the nearby village. Huh, I'm going alone. Sorry. We've got some preparations to make. Fufu, it's an important preparation. To celebrate you, Cheyenne. I couldn't help but grin. I tried not to think about it, but today's my birthday. It would be a big celebration, just like last year. I guess I'll spend time somewhere and I'll be back by night. Don't eat anything. I'll see you later. Oh yeah. I forgot to tell you. It was kind of embarrassing, standing in front of them, who were looking at me with puzzling expressions, but I tried very hard to get my feelings across. Erasing sadness from the world thanks so much for not laughing at this inordinate goal of mine and coming with me all this time. I bowed my head. When I looked up, I was surprised to see Luna and Lamia with pained expressions, and Emily crying. S sorry for saying a weird thing so suddenly. No, it's just that something got caught in my eye, Cheyenne, see you later. Yeah, see you guys later. I watched the three of them walk away as I though maybe that was a bit too cringy. As I started walking, my tension rose as I imagined what tonight was going to be like. Come on, I'm 25 already, stop being so excited. I ran down the street with light steps. I couldn't wait for tonight. I found a party struggling against a large goblin so I called out to them. Do you need help? I don't know who you are, but please. This guy's too strong. Large goblins are taller than 5 meters, and they are wide as well. They are called obese goblins for a reason. I pulled out nether sword, arse bite, and took a swing. PSSSSSH. A countless number of slashes flew, and the obese goblin's body tore apart. I smiled at the adventurers, who were looking at me with open mouths. Well, I'll be on my way. W8. Are you Shine Sama, by any chance? Um. That mask, the black clothes, that handsome voice. You're definitely him, aren't you? Yeah, I guess. We're big fans. We started training and became adventurers because we admire you. For some reason, I'm quite popular even among the heroes. I'm not much at all, so I guess the mask might be making me seem mysterious and spreading the rumors. I started on my way after I shook hands with all of them. My heart is pounding even though I'm taking deep breaths. Isn't my heart beating faster than when I was against strong enemies in the demon army? In any case, it was 7 o'clock at night, and I stepped into the inn. The owner came to me with a business smile on his face and greeted me. Welcome. I presume you're Mr. Axe. Why yeah. The whole place is reserved for you. Miss Emily and the others will be here soon, so take a seat. I took off my mask and sat down at a table. By the way, I go by Axe in public. Ugh, I'm so nervous. I saw three beautiful girls walk down the stairs just as I was wondering where they were. Sorry for the wait. Whoa, all of you look really pretty. All three of them were wearing dresses that revealed their shoulders and had makeup on. They were already beautiful as they were, so their beauty took my breath away. I'm so glad you like it. 
but tonight's all about you. Happy birthday, Cheyenne. Happy birthday. They handed me gifts along with the words of congratulations. Handmade gloves, a cloth to clean my mask, and a scabbard. My eyes started to tear up as I saw their smiles. Whoa, why are you crying, Cheyenne? I, I am not crying. You're so cute, Cheyenne. I can't help but love that part of you, but you can't be dressed like that on your birthday. Let me take those. Yeah, thanks. I handed Lamia my nether sword. I jumped as Emily then tangled her thin fingers in my hand. Won't you take off your rings as well? It's your birthday, why not forget that you're a hero, just for today? Some of these rings have powerful effects. But the most important one is the one I received from the king, the Ring of Proof. It was a symbol of being a hero, and I handed her this one as well. Wait, there's still more, you know? Oh, this as well, ha. Huh? I took off my earring as Luna pointed at it. It negates any sort of binding attack, and if you sold it you could probably live off the money for ten lifetimes. Hey Cheyenne. We've got a surprise, so can you close your eyes? I did as Luna said. Last year I had my eyes open a little bit. This time, I'll make sure to shut them completely, huh? My strength is fading. I opened my eyes and was met with a breathtaking sight. All three of them, from in front of me and on both sides, were using a binding staff on me. Threads of light extended from the tips and were wrapped around me tightly. Usually it wouldn't affect me, but right now I didn't have my earring on. What are you? All three of them were silent. Instead, three other people showed up from behind them and answered. Ha ha ha, you finally fell for it. It took so long. You, hero of fire. The heroes of wind and earth were here as well. I've met them a few times before, but I don't like them. Why were they here? They laughed at my confusion. Let me tell you. This was a magnificent plan. One that took three years. Exactly. We join forces to take you down. The party members you trusted, all of them work for us. Ugh. You're lying, that can't be true. Luna, Lamia, and Emily all looked away. The hero of fire laughed again. You're so optimistic. But it's all thanks to it that our plan worked so well. Why would you do this? It's because you're too strong. No one can beat you. Even the demon lord got scared and ran away. I'll admit that I'm jealous. You're strong. On top of that, you're the most popular hero. The strongest element hero is Axe. All the people agree. Even the sacred heroes don't make light of you. They did this for such absurd reasons, this is exactly why I hate you guys. Enough talk. Take everything. Yes. This man will break free any time now. No hard feelings, all right? The heroes took out magic stealing stones and pressed them onto my body. My strength was being sucked away quickly. All of them broke into several pieces. The amount of magic I had exceeded their capacity limits. I think we got around 90%. I'm surprised that three wasn't enough. Hero of Wind. Deal with these. Of course. The female hero gathered the stones, walked outside and came back a short time later. I used the power of wind to scatter them all over the world. I guess you can try your best to go find all of them. Then the earth hero pointed a teleport staff at me. I'll send you to a dark forest that even heroes nor demon lords enter. It was a very dangerous forest, but I didn't care. I called out to my party, former party members. Luna, were the words that you said to me when I was feeling down, all lies? Lamia. The smile you had on your face when we were practicing swords together, was all of that fake? Emily, you always said we were linked together by bonds. Have you believed that, even a little bit? Say something. Strong emotion bubbled from the inside of my heart. Whether it was anger or sadness, or maybe both. I forced myself out of my restraints. Ha! Huh. How? We took his strength away. What is this guy? This is bad. Hurry and teleport him. She gave me a second. I didn't care about them. I kept calling the three who had their heads down. Answer me Luna. I I was just ordered to, so. 
Lamia. I, my real party is elsewhere. Emily. I'm sorry. I was just acting on orders. They said it so easily. My head drooped, and I covered my face with the mask that was by my side. Hurry. Shoot him. Take this. The teleportation magic shot from the staff. I could have dodged it. But I didn't care. I wouldn't have moved even if that was a magic that could have killed me. Before I disappeared, I tried to look at the faces at the three of them one last time and stopped myself. What good was that going to do? I tried so hard and finally found something important and irreplaceable, but it disappeared in an instant. My life was always like this. Chapter 2 White Fox with a Death Wish My Eighth Birthday A day I could never forget. It was on this day which my misfortune began. During a family trip, my family and I were attacked by bandits and my parents and my sister were killed. No matter how much I cried and struggled it didn't matter. I was powerless to do anything. I survived due to the hero of darkness coincidentally passing by and defeating the bandits, I was empty inside, like my soul I departed with my family. A lot of things happened after that, and I became the hero of darkness's disciple. Apparently, I had talent for it, and I inherited the position of Hero of Darkness at the age of 12, and have lived as a hero until today, at the age of 25. Not all things were bad. There were times where I found happiness. But for some reason, it always slipped from my fingers like sand. I can't help but feel foolish for thinking that I've finally grasped my happiness after meeting the three girls. If fate was real, I must have been born under a bad star. A dim, humid forest covered my line of sight. A spooky bird cry sounded, but I didn't bother checking my surroundings and sat down. I only felt emptiness. It's always like this, isn't it? Loving someone, just to have them depart before me, and trusting someone, just to have them betray me. Over and over. I was desperate, thinking that maybe if I become strong and save the world, something would change. But the single thread that kept me going deep inside my heart had completely snapped. I set the mask that was the symbol of the Hero of Darkness onto the ground. I wasn't a hero anymore since I lost my ring. Ugh, eh. The memories with my party members crossed my mind. The three years, scenes where the four of us were laughing kept coming up. It was fun. If that was all a lie, I can't trust people anymore. My wails didn't stop. I cried like a child. The dark, creepy forest like this one suited a betrayed hero like me very well. Once I calmed down, I weakly stood up. My mind became a bit clearer after crying. I walked around the forest with no weapon or equipment. If this was indeed the dark forest, I was on a different continent. Spread, dark wings. It was a technique that gave a pair of pitch black wings, but only one spread out on my back. It must be because my strength was taken. I can't fly, but I can use it for combat, ha. Huh? After walking for five minutes, an ogre appeared in front of me. In fact, it was a high ogre, a high rank species. HM, a strong one. The red hair mixed between all the white hair was its characteristic. Stumbling across something like this, I guess this is indeed the dark forest. Stomp stomp stomp. It started a ferocious charge. It was an impressive sight. But too straightforward. I spread my wing and shot black feathers at it. Ugh. As soon as the feathers hit the high ogre, the places where they were stuck immediately started to rot. One or two was still survivable, but over ten was death. The high ogre rotted away without reaching me. It can't be something like this. Ending my life with a monster without even the slightest trace of dignity is pathetic. Snort. This time it was a three-eyed fighting bull. It was a species I've never seen before. It started charging so I shot black feathers at it just like I did to the high ogre, but they were reflected right before they hit. A physical barrier. I was surprised that it was intelligent. But why does it continue to charge with the barrier up? But then what were those horns for? My question was answered. It removed the barrier right before it hit. It creates a barrier when I gain distance, ha. Huh. Pretty sharp. But then again. I sunk into my own shadow and rose from my opponents. It's called Shadow Bind. 
I punched the monster's head. It died instantly. My speed decreased, and my punch didn't have much force behind it. I was weakened quite a bit. In my current state, I might be able to fight with all my strength and lose. My expectation came true. A few hours after the fight with the bull, my instincts reacted to a white fox that slowly appeared before me. I'll lose. There are fights which are decided before they even start. This was one of them. If I was at full strength I would win but with only 10% of my strength left, that would be impossible. It was larger and more beautiful than a normal fox. It was covered in fluffy, snowy white fur, and its face had an air of intelligence to it as well. Can you understand words? Yes. You have good pronunciation. I've played with some humans who entered the forest before. You're going to eat me, right? Of course, I'm not. He had no hostility towards me whatsoever. This is troublesome. A moment of silence followed. As I opened my mouth, the fox did so too at the same time. Can you kill me? Can you kill me please? The white fox looked dumbfounded, but I probably have the same expression he does. Did you just ask me to kill you? Yes. Did you just? Yeah I did. What a coincidence. Pfft. It sounded just like the old man that lived next door a long time ago, so I unexpectedly burst out laughing. Ah, why did you laugh? My bad. You're really like a human. You look smart too. Even a fox can get embarrassed, you know? The way it swung his tail from side to side was quite lovely. I wonder if its nature is closer to a dog than a fox. I want to talk with you a bit. Is that all right? Same here. In any case, let me burn that real quick. Right after it gently said that, the white fox widened his eyes. It was immediately followed by a disgusting cry behind me. A very small species of goblin burned to the ground by the sudden flames that erupted. I was so focused on you, I didn't notice it. Chibblins are good at getting behind your back. A chibblin. Now, let's go somewhere we can relax. Follow me. The white fox turned its back to me. Is it really okay with getting killed? We're in the same boat. Since I'm following it without being alert at all. We moved to a place where it was relatively easier to scan our surroundings. The white fox sat down like a dog and started to speak. My name is Akuko. You can call me Haku. I'm a male. Cheyenne. I'm a former hero, if you understand what that is. Of course. I have quite a bit of human knowledge. I've lived for over 300 years, after all. He's got quite a cheerful personality. It makes me wonder even more why he wants to die. Is it alright if I talk about my life story first? Please tell me. I used to travel all over the place with my family, and we settled in this forest. We lived peacefully for a while, but my parents eventually passed away. The fox I loved died as well. So have my children. Eventually, my grandchildren died as well. Were they killed by monsters? No, they lived through their lifespan. I'm a variant species. Variants were monsters who underwent sudden change, and often had longer lifespans. A white fox's average lifespan is around 50 years. But I've lived 300 and I'm still full of life. I don't want to be lonely anymore. Watching the ones you love die is, huh? Why are you crying Cheyenne? Sniff, I, I am not see crying. You're crying so much. The tears are just rolling down your face. It's, s salt water. You, I've never heard someone make that excuse. How many times is a grown man like me going to cry in one day? This is so disappointing. But I couldn't help but empathize. I understand how you feel. I lost my family, and the person I loved. Oh, I see. Let me hear your story this time. Where should I start? Before I became the hero of darkness. After I became him. All that happened until this day. I told him everything. Haku was sobbing. He was sobbing since I was talking about my childhood. What part of my childhood was the saddest? The part where the old man living next to you who talks like me dies. I see. Well, you've had a hard time as well. 
What cruel heroes they are, aren't you going to take revenge? I shook my head at the question. I don't care anymore. I don't want to live anymore. I see. Then, do you want to die, together? If you're fine with it. I'll be more than welcome to. Two people dying together is better than dying alone. Well, I'm not a person, though. Hee <laughs> hee. You've got a weird laugh. But Haku's character makes me at ease. Now that I think about it, this was the first time I've been able to talk about my past this smoothly. So, do you think it's about time we died? I'm always ready. We stood up and faced each other. I took a deep breath and exhaled, calming my heart. I didn't imagine I would end this way. Surprisingly, this doesn't feel too bad. Chapter 3 Find the Golden Serpent. Nom nom nom. Nom 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 nom. Nom 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 gulp. Monster meat crisply cooked with fox fire. There was quite a bit of it, but it was disappearing at an incredible rate, into Haku's stomach. You eat so much. Sorry. I eat quite a bit despite my looks. I mean, with that size of yours, you do look like you eat a lot. Are you calling me fat? I'm pretty lean, you know. Um, all the meat is dropping down from your mouth. Ah. It's because you're saying weird things. Turns out that we're still alive. Because right before we started our killing moves, Haku's stomach rumbled very loudly. What do you think about eating something before dying? I accepted his suggestion and currently we were having a meal together. I don't like raw meat that much so I cook it. Burp oh, excuse me. I didn't know white foxes burped. I guess there's still much to learn about this world. Haku laughed and scratched his cheek with his tail, looking embarrassed. My stomach was full. It was a peaceful time. But when I suggested that we finally put an end to everything, Haku didn't say yes. Em, do you have anything you want to do before you die? I live for a long time, but you certainly haven't. Nothing in particular. Are you sure? Don't you have people you want to meet or apologize to? Someone, I want to apologize to. Now that he mentioned it, there is one person. You do, I see. Let's go see that person. It's not too late to die after that. But. No buts. Here, hop on. Haku crouched and pointed at his back with his tail. I slowly got onto his back. Where does that person live? It's Kalu Village. It's in this region. I know where that is. The people there helped me once a long time ago. Once he knew where he was going, Haku was ridiculously fast. He ran through the forest at a speed that made my hair blow all the way back. This could be fate, I guess. Getting blown away to this continent must be a sign from God, telling me to visit the grave one last time. If that's the case, the only thing I can do is accept it. We reached Kalu village three days later. I was surprised by Haku's bottomless strength. It hasn't changed much at all. Haku said keenly, looking at the peaceful farm village. So tell me what happened when you visited this place. When I got here, I saved the village from an ogre attack. I'm sure no one who remembers that day is still alive. While we were talking to each other, the villagers shouted and screamed. Aren't you Axe? H.I. It's been a while. Everyone, Axe is here. What? The villagers came out, with enough momentum to make the ground shake, and surrounded me. Among them were a few who were about to be overcome with tears. Thanks for coming again, Axe. We've all been waiting for you to come back. Is Lin here? Lin is out right now. But she should be back soon. Then please let me visit Mary's grave. At the end of the village was a graveyard, so Haku and I headed there. Wow, you're really popular. I'm supposed to be a rare fox monster, but I was completely ignored. I was helped a lot by this place a long time ago. My chest hurt as remembered. I clapped my palms together in front of Mary's grave. She was the person I loved, as well as the person who died because of me. I see, my name is Akuko, and I'm Cheyenne's friend. Haku sat down and put his paws together like I was doing. He was being sensible, as he didn't ask me anything. As I looked up at the blue sky, I recalled Mary's smiling face. Even now, my heart still loves her. 
While I was being sentimental, a slight pain ran through my shoulder. It seemed like someone threw a potato. At me. What did you come here for? A young lady with long straight hair was glaring at me. The girl who at the time, was in her teens, was now a grown-up woman. Lynn. It's been a while. I told you to never come back ever again. Sorry. Her reaction was to be expected. She was Mary's younger sister, so of course she would hate me for not being able to protect Mary that day. You're done visiting her grave now, right? Hurry up and leave. That's no way to talk, stupid girl. It wasn't me or Haku that shouted. It was the village chief, who was walking nearby. Mary's death wasn't Axe's fault. Rather than that, Axe being here helped our village tremendously. Apologize to him right now. What's with all of you, treating me like I'm the bad guy? Just leave me alone. Lynn angrily ran off. I tried to stop her, but she didn't look back. Let me apologize in her place, Axe. Please stop, Chief. Lynn's behavior is to be expected. Please don't be too hard on her, please. After telling that to the village chief, I told him I wanted to be alone. After he left, I walked to Mary's grave again. Long time no see, Mary. A lot happened after that, I ended up, quitting being a hero. Mary and I met each other here and fell in love with each other. We dated for around three years, and even got engaged. She taught me how to love people. But one day, while I was working on a job in a nearby city, the village was attacked by wyverns and Mary died. There were frequent sightings of wyverns above the village during that time. If I didn't leave for the city but instead stayed at the village, Mary wouldn't have died. It was all because I made the wrong decision. I haven't forgotten the regret I felt not being able to protect the one who was most precious to me, not even for a day. After I was done, I knocked on Lynn's door. Still, what do you want? I want to talk to you. What? I ended up quitting being a hero. And I was wondering if there's something I could do, as atonement for my sin. Then go bring me a golden serpent. Golden serpent, ha. Huh. It was a rare snake and hard to find. Lynn's gaze turned cold as I was thinking to myself. That day, I begged you, remember? I have a bad feeling so don't leave. But you? I'm sorry, from the bottom of my heart. You don't have to find the snake. In return, please don't appear in front of me ever again. The door closed. It was a bit painful, but I need to accept it. To Lynn, Mary was her only family. But because she got involved with me. Cheyenne, are you finished? Haku, good timing. I want to go into the mountain and find a golden serpent. That's pretty valuable. You coming? Or are you going to stay? Of course, I'm going. To be honest, dealing with the village chief was quite tiring. Ah, the chief talks a lot, after all. Now that we decided what to do, we rushed to the nearby mountain. I haven't been here in years, but it was the same scenery as back then. It's in this mountain, right? Definitely. A few days if we're lucky, if not we'll be camping out here for a month. Day 1. Haku, is it over there? I found a ringed grass snake. It won't bit if you leave it alone. I got bit. It has a strong poison, you know. Uh, I don't feel well. Haku fell to the ground loudly. As I approached him he started breathing heavily and started saying words of goodbye. Hmm. Were the effects this immediate? I'm glad, I met you Cheyenne. Good, bye, asterisk plunk asterisk. Who thinks that he's a bad actor? I raised my hand. Haku jumped up and started spinning in circles happily. He he he, sorry. You act so mischievous, you know that? Back when my family was alive, every day was like this. It's so nostalgic. Recalling memories is fine, but don't forget what we're looking for. Of course. Day 2. It's not showing up at all. We just gotta be patient. I heard about Mary and Lynn. Oh, the chief kept talking about it on his own. I see. I don't think Cheyenne is to blame. Thanks, I'm feeling kind of hungry. I'll go catch something right now. An hour later, there was a large pile of monsters stacked in front of me. 
didn't you hunt a bit too much? The sound of my stomach told me to keep going. Ha, ah, let's eat then. Yeah. We didn't find the golden serpent today either, but for some reason today was very enjoyable. Day 3. Hey Cheyenne, how big was a golden serpent? It's been so long since I've seen one. Ah, it's definitely not because I'm going senile, okay? It looks like a viper. Its skin is a deep yellow color. Like that, for example. Haku pointed at a single snake slithering between the trees with the tip of his tail. Yeah, it's colored just like that. Hmm, sounds like it could be sold expensively. Isn't that it? That's it. We darted instantly. Haku, go from the right. Roger that. I went around to the left. Me, the snake, and Haku were lined up side by side, in this order. First, Haku's claws hit the ground. It meant that he missed. Hua, this snake is a lot faster than I thought. I'm hoping we can capture it alive. Then how about this? A few strands of Haku's fur stood up straight and shot out. One of them hit the snake, and it started slowing down, eventually coming to a stop. It's called Fur Needle. I can change its hardness, or cause sleep or paralysis. The one you just used is sleep? Yes. Huh, its eyes are open. Snakes don't have eyelids, so. I've been living for 300 years, but I've never known that. He seemed quite shocked, drooping his head. He went back to normal as soon as I patted him on the head, though. His show of emotion was richer than most humans, in a sense. Well, Haku has a large body, but he has the cuteness of a puppy, after all. I smile naturally formed on my face. CH4, a hero's heart, unfading. We've managed to capture the golden serpent, so now we can go back to Kalu village. As Haku and I were climbing down the mountain, three wolf monsters attacked us. I'll take care of them. Bam, bam, bam. Three lightning fast bites took care of them. You're pretty strong, as expected. Not at all. I have claws and teeth like a beast, just in case. You could use fox fire as well, right? If the enemy is flammable and in range. Some are immune to flames, though. You've got a lot of moves, since you can launch your fur, too. I'm a fox with many secrets, he. As we were exchanging information about each other's abilities, we reached Crew Village. I dropped the bag that was slung across my shoulder, but in the next moment. Something, seems wrong, doesn't it? Let's go further. It was weird that bottles were broken and plows left on the ground. When we reached the center of the village, a lot of the villagers were gathered and were in a panic. Chief, what happened? Oh, Master Axe. A group of bandits suddenly attacked about an hour ago. What the hell? I looked around and saw that there were many injured. Some even seemed to have fatal wounds. Damn it. Didn't the village have hired bodyguards? They were all killed, the boss was unbelievably strong. I don't see Lin. Don't tell me they took her. That's exactly what happened. They took all the young women and children. Which direction? South. Will you please help us? Don't ask me something like that. This is the village Mary grew up in. I'll save it, even if it costs me my life. I walked over to the dead bodyguard and wished him luck in the afterlife. I'll be borrowing this weapon. I equipped a good quality sword across my back and turned to Haku. Will you help me? You don't have to ask. I'll go with you, even if it's the depths of hell. I nodded deeply and mounted his back. We're going to save them. Kyuun. Haku let out a shrill howl, and within seconds was at top speed. I gripped his fur tightly, trying not to get shaken off. In this world, what happened to the village happens somewhere every day. Demons and demon lords are not the only evil. In fact, true evil lies in people's hearts. People against people, aristocrats against commoners, family against their own flesh and blood, conflict occurs. Sometimes they wage war, putting heroes at their side. I was tired of such a world. My family was killed during a trip. When I was chosen to be a hero, I swore to God that I would change the world. But reality was harsh. There are things that strength can't change. 
people's greed and desire can't be erased easily. The world won't change. But still, I. There they are. It's definitely that group. I don't remember throwing away my heart as well. Running in front of us were dozens of horses and a few carriages. The ones riding them were armed bandits. Boss. Someone is pursuing us. He's probably a beast tamer or something. All of you, stop. There's around thirty of them. It's strange that they have such good equipment. I got off Haku and scanned the carriages. The women's faces were swollen, as if they got hit. Lin was on the floor, writhing in pain. You used violence on women? The skin-headed man that seemed to be the boss glared at me. A lot of them had an attitude, so we did it to shut them up. Even so, that's too much. The one on the ground resisted too much. She isn't dead yet. No mercy needed. I drew my sword and raised it. Why did you target the village? You're no ordinary bandit. You're pretty sharp. I'll tell you because I'll be killing you anyway. We're mercenaries. We were ordered to gather up women. Who's your client? Now answering that would be insolence. You guys take care of the dog. Rude. I'm a fox you know. Haku tackled a few of the bandits and blew them away. The rest didn't even flinch, and one jabbed his sword in him. You okay? No worries. I hardened my fur. Leave the small fries to me. Haku moved away from me and started taking on the bandits. Now I can focus on the one versus one against the boss. You know why I let all my underlings handle the beast, right? It's because he's stronger, right? Not even close. It's because weaklings like them will just get in the way. Then you should just operate alone in the first place. You're strong. But you'll never be able to beat me. Because my power was handed to me directly from a hero. The boss threw the knives, three in each hand, towards me. Each of them took different orbitals, but they were all headed towards me. I deflected all of them with my sword. I see, it definitely is an unusual technique. But a technique of this degree can't be one that was handed down by a hero. You shouldn't be thinking that hard during a fight. A metallic sound rang. I blocked his saber with my sword. His strength wasn't impressive. I easily pushed back and cut down diagonally. From our differences in strength, this should do it. What? Who, that was close. My blade barely scraped him. This guy. Did his movement just go ahead of mine? We started to clash swords once again. By the fifth time, my sword broke. This saber is a destruction-type magic weapon. Everyone falls prey to this, and so will you. Right before the saber pierced my heart, I used shadow bind to sink under my feet. The boss's shadow is behind him. I re-emerged from there and punched the back of his head. Whoa! Again, ha! Huh. It was the same as before. It wasn't that he was able to react to it. It was even faster. Like he knew what was coming. Phew, that was close, was that darkness magic? Yours is the eyes. It's not a perception type. Why you found out, just like that? If you put it together with the fact that you mentioned a hero, I'm guessing the hero of divine eyes gave you the ability to see the future. The boss's eyes widened, and gulped. That response was enough to tell that he was right. Not limited to heroes, in this world there are idiosyncratic people who are able to share a portion of their power at a low risk, and they are nuisances. Which means, your client is the hero. Wrong. Huh, you aren't faced at all. You can't land a single blow on me, and you don't have a sword, either. I do have a sword. Darkness, manifest in the shape of a sword, darkness sword of five losses. I gripped the darkness that took the shape of a sword. It was a weapon of black the only I could summon and use. Without missing a beat, I swung it casually. I told you, I see everything. It doesn't matter whether you can see it or not. What? The black sword went through the saber and easily cut the boss. Well, although it cut him, it can't really injure him. Instead. Eh, huh, how? The sun's still up, why is everything getting so dark? Looks like you lost your sight. You didn't even hit my eyes. 
the sword of five losses is supposed to take all five of your senses. But right now, it seems like I can only take one. Too bad it seems like it's random. But for him this should be more than enough. Further resistance is futile, you know? Stay still. Yeah, I'll do that. The boss took a deep breath and held his saber in a backhand grip. Wait, too late, huh? Committed suicide by piercing his own heart. I've seen it a few times. There were people who did this, fearing torture. I felt a slight sense of emptiness, but immediately checked behind me. All done over here. Good job, Haku. Now. I climbed up the carriage to Len and raised her up in my arms. There was blackened blood on her face. She also had bruises on her body. Uh, uh, Cheyenne. You don't have to say anything. Looks like I can use Shadow Bag. It was a spell that let me store things in a special pocket space. I immediately pulled out a top quality potion. It's an X potion. Drink it, you'll feel better. Why would you use something like that? I'm using it because it's you. The liquid trickled into her mouth. Its effect was immediate, and not even 30 seconds passed before she was recovered. Isn't that the medicine that's worth 10 houses? It's only worth 10 houses. A small price to pay, isn't it? But why? I said all those mean things to you. It's all right. You should rest. Lynn is a delicate woman, but she pushed herself even though she was scared. Her trembling shoulders told me that. As I stepped down from the caravan after calming everyone, I heard a small voice behind me. I'm sorry. I turned back with a smile and gave a thumbs up. The next day, after everything settled down, I decided to leave Kalu village before noon. I was happy that the village chief and the villagers saw us out of the entrance. We can't thank you enough. This isn't much, but still. The chief tried to give me a bag full of jewels and such, but I declined. Please use it to rebuild the village. I'm not good with shining stuff, because I'm the hero of darkness, you know? Poo pee pee That's weird, Haku's the only one laughing. This is a bit embarrassing. Ahem. There doesn't seem to be any bandits left, so be rest assured. If I sense something strange or weird, I'll come back, so don't worry. Thank you so much for everything you've done. Oh, and please send Lin my regards. We'll go get her right now. No, it's fine. We're about to leave, anyway. I waved at everyone and said goodbye. I had Haku stop after a short distance and looked back. This is my last look at that village, huh? Cheyenne, about that. I've got something I want to talk to you about, too. I was about to express my thought but stopped. A girl was running towards us, calling my same. Axe. Wait. Lynn. My heart started racing, seeing that she was out of breath from trying to catch up. You came all this way to see me off? There's something I need to say to you. Lynn caught her breath and gazed into my eyes. To be honest, I knew everything, that day, my sister told you to go do your job, right? Even so, my sin won't be washed away. It's not a sin. It's not. You're not responsible. You always worked for the village, for my sister. You were a great hero, helping others. Had I been accomplishing that? I felt powerless against the world, and I wasn't confident. Lynn put her arms on my shoulders as I stood there, staring down at the ground. I was being a child. I couldn't bear the sadness if I didn't make it someone's fault, I couldn't go on, I was weak, but I'll stop now. I won't do that anymore. Lynn. So, from now on, you should live for yourself too. You stopped being a hero, right? Then from now on live for yourself. You've done enough. There are so many people that have been saved by you. You can't die, even if something hard happens. Here, take this. I was surprised at what she handed me. It was the golden serpent preserved in liquor. It's really good. Drink it on the way to the city. Thanks. I'll enjoy it. Come back again. I'll be waiting. I will. Definitely. I hugged her and departed with a smile. I felt warmth in the depths of my heart. The frozen emotions silently melted. 
I felt the frustration that was inside me for a long time disappear. Oh dash, I just remember dash dot. Whoa. Haku's sudden shout almost made me fall off. Sorry about that. But I remembered something important. It's about the golden serpent preserved in liquor. Tell me about it. I heard this story from a certain man around 200 years ago. When a man was tired of life and was about to select death, his wife gave him the serpent wine. Then suddenly the man became happy and forgot he wanted to die. I looked at the golden serpent. I guess, this means Lin saw through me since the beginning. Hey Haku, I want to discuss something. Go ahead. About dying together, do you mind if we push that back a bit? There might be things in this world that we haven't seen yet, you know. That's exactly what I wanted to tell you earlier. It won't hurt to live a bit longer and enjoy life, won't it? I gave Haku a broad smile as he winked at me. Growl. 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 Hey Haku, isn't your stomach being a bit too loud? That's embarrassing Dash. I'll go hunt something Dash. I saw Haku off, shaking his tail as he darted away, with a smile. It was a strange feeling. Just a week ago. I was the hero of darkness. Just a few days ago. I wanted death. But now. I was taking a step forward. I guess you could call this, a second shot at life. A wandering journey with a white fox, huh? That doesn't sound too bad. CH5, the Ironclad City and Q1. The Ironclad City, Oregon. It was famous for not allowing invasions from other nations as well as monsters and bandits and has been called the impenetrable city for dozens of years. The largest factor was its outer wall. It was a square wall that surrounded the city, like many other cities but they used a special material that gave it an unusual hardness and was durable even against magic attacks. To be more specific, it was strong against any attack that had some sort of magic inside it. Of course, it includes magic items as well. Cannons, magic, attacks from monsters. It wouldn't let them through if they were lukewarm efforts. But that was not the only reason it was called Ironclad, in fact, this one is the greater reason why the city was impenetrable, and Cheyenne knew what it was. Oregon has been the birthplace and home of the hero of divine eyes, generation after generation. Huh, I think I've heard that somewhere a long time ago. Cheyenne and Haku were having such a conversation while looking at Oregon, which stood in the distance. Did you know that there are a few conditions for becoming a hero? Ah, I've heard about it before. You have to challenge the current hero and win, right? That's one of the ways. The other way is to have the current hero accept you as a successor and inherit the hero's ring. I was the latter. But even so, both had conditions. The person had to have affinity to the attribute or the special power of the hero. If it was the hero of darkness, you would have to be able to use darkness attribute magic and abilities. For hero of divine eyes, even if you defeated the current hero in battle, you couldn't become a hero if you didn't master eye type powers. Let's get back on track. The reason why the city is called Ironclad. This is due to the hero of divine eyes. His eyes can see through his enemy's movements and oppositions. I see. That's why it's Ironclad. You can easily set up measures if you know everything your enemy is trying to do. Exactly. And surprisingly, the hero of divine eyes is always someone born and raised in this city. So, there are many with I-type abilities? Apparently. Well, I haven't met the Hero of Divine Eyes before, though. But it's kind of scary. Do you think he can see what I'm thinking right now? Yeah, I can tell even though I can't read minds. You want to eat really bad, right? What? How? Ha ha ha, anyone can tell. Cheyenne laughed and pointed at Haku's stomach, which was growling loudly. Haku hit his head between his paws, embarrassed. To the two of them, having such conversations was a heartful time, but it didn't appear so to the guards in the distance. When Cheyenne and Haku reached the south gate, there were fully armed soldiers with alarm on their faces, waiting for them. Usually there were two guards per gate, right now there was over ten times that number. Stop. Stop, I say. Oh, looks pretty unsafe. Haku said out loud like it wasn't his problem. Haku was the cause but Cheyenne didn't point that out but instead answered the soldier. 
I'm a traveler. This is my familiar, and it won't cause any harm to humans. Prove it. Haku, sit. As you wish. Haku smartly responded to Shion and sat down like a dog. He then even lied down and wagged his fluffy tail. He then patted Shion's cheek. Ha ha, Haku, that tickles. This is a white fox style of communication, showing affection to his master and brushing the dust off of his face at the same time. H he's pretty smart. Is that a werewolf? No, a fox? Don't tell me it's a magic fox. It's too big. Plus, in this region fire, ice, and lighting foxes have red, blue, yellow fur respectively. I've never seen a white one before. I'm a variant species. The soldier's eyes widened further. Mostly because they were whispering, but Haku had heard their conversation. As expected from an A-rank subjectable monster, even if you're a variant. Your ears are too good. Among monsters, there are ones that humans can subdue, and ones that will never subject to humans. The former is called subjectable monsters, and there are even ranks based on what kind of monster it is. But even though it is a subjectable monster, that doesn't mean it was easy to make it a familiar. When it came to A ranks, the chances of success were very low, even for top class beast tamers. Which meant that it was natural for the soldiers' attentions to focus on Cheyenne, who had the magic fox as his familiar. What are you? I'm just a traveler. I just luckily ran into Haku. Seems unlikely for a magic fox to follow an ordinary traveler, but it's fine. Does he have any abilities that can prove he's a magic fox? We need to give him a formal registration to let him in. I can use the common abilities of magic foxes. Then can you show us? Yes, sir. He didn't want to deal with any problems, so Haku took a deep breath and let out a roar that was a common ability among magic foxes, making sure to hold back. Kiaounun. It sounded like a dog's howl, but the force behind it was incredible. The sound and impact that broke forth seemed to shake the ground and the atmosphere. It's an ability called Beast Roar. You guys probably have seen it at least once. It's used to make the enemy flinch or rob them of their courage. Hey Haku, I'm the only one listening to your explanation, you know that. Why? Because everyone except me fainted. Haku started sweating nervously as he gazed at the soldiers sprawled on the ground. Huh. They can't even handle that? He murmured. He didn't hold back enough at all. After wondering what to do for a moment longer, Haku stuck his tongue out in a cute gesture and feigned innocence. CH6, Adventurer Registration After caring and apologizing to the soldiers, Cheyenne and Haku managed to help them back to consciousness. Thankfully, they didn't get scolded and were able to register and enter the city. My name is Cheyenne. The guard barely reacted. The name of the famous hero of darkness was Axe, and only a few knew about his real name, including his predecessor and ex-party members. Even they called him Axe in front of others, so it was impossible for ordinary people to hear the name of Cheyenne and link him to the hero of darkness. Just a reminder, don't make a ruckus inside. This is the city of the hero of divine eyes as well, so. Of course. I just want to register at the Adventurer's Guild and the Business Guild. If you're going to the Adventurer's Guild, I recommend going to the third branch. There are three branches in Oregon, but the third branch has the best records. Thank you so much. Cheyenne paid tax and entered the city. He paid 30 copper coins, 3,000 gowns for a week's stay, because he had to be treated as a vagrant with no identification card. Cheyenne felt the disparity from when he was a hero, when all he needed to do was show them his ring. I'm sorry Cheyenne. I already messed up. Don't worry about it. Even I didn't expect them to faint just from a roar. Honestly, it's a bit worrying, isn't it? Yeah, a bit. They were talking about whether it was fine for those guards to be at the gates. Even though the city was strong, if the guards could be taken out in a second, someone or something might be able to infiltrate. Hey Haku, do you mind if I go register at the Adventurer's Guild first? Not having identification is kind of uncomfortable. Sure. Third branch was it, what's that? Haku pointed out the reaction of the residents. There were people going back and forth on the street, but when they passed Cheyenne and Haku, they retreated to the edges of the street. Ah, they're scared of me. 
I'm sure they understand that you're my familiar, but they must be doing it instinctively. Hop on. You're right. When Cheyenne climbed up on top of Haku, the residents let out a sigh of relief. But as before, the middle of the street was still open to the two of them. So Cheyenne was in the middle of the street all by himself, in the presence of all the residents. Thinking to himself, I didn't want to stand out like this, though. Haku, you're a variant species of magic fox, right? Other than white fox, my species is called color fox. Do you want to know my hidden powers? Not for now. I trust you completely. Such kind words, I'm about to cry. You're already crying though. I'm just so happy. It feels like back when my family was alive. We're all alone in this world, you and me. Let's be good friends. Con. Con con. Asterisk. There you go again, you don't have to try to be so cute, you know? But if I'm not careful, I might go wahoo, and stuff. I figured it would be annoying with this huge body of mine. While having such light-hearted conversations, Cheyenne asked a few residents where to find the third branch. It was a guild that received a lot of juicy quests, but the registration conditions were harsh. Although they weren't sure what those were, apparently there were quite a few applicants who ran away in a panic every now and then. Do you think they use violence against applicants? They said that there are many rough-natured people there, so we should be prepared. Look, we're here. The guild was located a distance away from where all the shops were. It was on a large piece of land and was two stories high. Age could be felt from it, but it was built sturdily, and the entrance was large enough for Haku to walk through. I didn't want to stand out but doesn't seem like we'll be able to. Mufufu. That's impossible since I'm with you, Mr. Cheyenne. He, I guess so. Let's go. This is exciting. Haku was excited at this unknown world, and Cheyenne felt his heart throbbing from excitement as well. When they went in, as they expected, the adventurer's eyes immediately focused on him. There were many sitting down at what looked like a bar, but currently none of them were making a sound. Hello, everyone. I'm a familiar, and I'm not hostile at all. Hmm, they're on guard, as I thought. Can't be helped. Let's start at the reception. Cheyenne walked over to the receptionist, who was a young woman with slightly tanned skin. There were a few receptionists, but half were women, the rest were men around 40. W what brings you here today? She was a bit, well, quite put off. Her gaze bounced between Cheyenne and Haku. Her heart raced uncontrollably since she wasn't used to seeing magical beasts up this close. Haku noticed it and gave her a smile, but she flinched at the sight of his fangs. Haku, shocked at her reaction, whispered to Cheyenne. I'm considered to be beautiful among magical beasts, but do you think they only see me as a monster? I think your fur is beautiful and you look really cool, though. Wahoo! It goes without saying that everyone inside the guild trembled. Cheyenne continued the registration process with a smile. CH7, weak tag. Cheyenne started with listening to the receptionist's explanation about the guild system. The guild exchanged information and worked together with the several nations that it made alliances with and had a main branch in all of them. There were three guilds in Oregon, but all of them were branches. There were seven ranks for me to SS, and it was possible to get demoted if you didn't go on a quest for a long time or continue to fail quests. Registration methods differed for every branch, and while for some there are no conditions, some have tests. If the guild accepts your registration, you would get a card that would act as identification. Mr. Cheyenne, would you be a beast tamer? Not really. Huh. You're not a beast tamer, but you have such a strong-looking magic beast. It was kind of like fate. T that's incredible. We have some that could tame a rank magical beasts, but they were trained from a young age. I'm not a beast tamer, but Haku is safe, so no need to worry. Okay. Then please tell me your combat method. I'm good with the sword, but I can use magic as well. I can use a number of low-class magic, and I'm best with darkness magic. Darkness magic. That's so cool. Just like Master Axe. While Cheyenne was confused at her sudden smile, Haku wasn't so at all. I respect Master Axe too. He's so cool, right? Glance, glance, dot. Same here. 
I'm actually a big fan. It was years ago, but he's visited this city before. What, I wanted to meet him. But you never know, he might be here in this city today. Glance glance, dot. Stop it Haku, alright? When Cheyenne said so, looking embarrassed, Haku closed his mouth with a smile on his face. Cheyenne wished he wouldn't tease him like that. The receptionist finally remembered her job as well and cleared her throat. For registration, we have two types of tests. The long one, which is to go on quests that we pick out for you every day, for the span of three months. And a short one that end within half a day. We, don't recommend the latter. What's the short test about? I can only tell you after you show intentions of taking it. It was either dangerous or difficult. After Cheyenne and Haku discussed the matter, both agreed that the long test was too dull. They were told the quests were simple, but they only accepted up to three failures, and having to do quests daily was tiring. I'll do the short one. You can get injured, and in the worst case, you can die. If you're okay with that, please sign here. Cheyenne signed the document and stamped with his blood as well. As soon as he did so, all the adventurers around them stood up all at once. Hey newbie, you unfortunately chose the short test, weak tag. Weak tag? When Cheyenne tilted his head at the unfamiliar term, another adventurer explained it. The applicant who chooses this test runs all over the city like a weakling. That's why it's called that. Here, take this. Then the receptionist handed out knit hats to everyone, including Cheyenne. It was an ordinary knit hat. Let me explain. Mr. Cheyenne, you will need to collect the hats of every adventurer that is here right now within 12 hours. If you succeed, you pass the test. If you run out of time or if you get your own hat taken, you fail. There were easily 30, 40 people in the room. He was in an outnumbered situation. There was no way of winning by regular means. Can I use any kind of method to take the hats? Yes, anything goes. But it is the same for the adventurers as well. Cheyenne now understood why she didn't recommend this test. Most applicants will be chased down and have their hats taken. He could get injured. They won't move for the next 10 seconds. Please use this time to start running. That seemed to be the rule. He got a warning out of goodwill, but Cheyenne didn't feel like moving. Would you want to do this without running? Hmm. If this number of people scattered outside. It'll be a lot of work. Should I go take all of them? It's my registration, so I should take part in it too. I'll appreciate the help, though. Got it. The adventurers heard their conversation and started turning red with anger that Cheyenne was looking lightly of them. That familiar of yours is definitely strong. But you know? Do you really think you could hold on to your own hat against this many of us, huh? Don't think this is going to be easy. No, that's not what I mean. It's just that I may or may not have a way to take all your hats at once. Then try it. I guess I will, then. After glancing at Haku, Cheyenne unleashed dark space. A small black cube appeared on the tip of Cheyenne's fingers and spread out and engulfed the whole room. The light from the windows and entrance disappeared. It was a spell that created a space of complete darkness. If he was at full strength, he could have engulfed the whole city, but now that he was weakened, that would be difficult, but he could still cover the whole room with ease. S so dark all of a sudden. What, is this? What's happening? The adventurers panicked at the unknown attack they've never faced before. The spell was a simple one among darkness magic, but it took time to activate, so many didn't use it for combat. Normal users couldn't make the space expand in a second like Shine could. He could have held the space for a few hours, but he released the spell after about 30 seconds. The adventurers were relieved that they came back to a world with light. But almost all of them had high heart rates and were out of breath. Humans tend to feel great amounts of stress when light is taken away suddenly. Whoa, you've gathered a lot Haku. Few fufin, I might have more than you do. One, two, three, I have twenty-two. Cheyenne let out a small groan and counted the number of knit hats that he had. Twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two, twenty-three. Yes. I have one more. Ah, I lost, ha ha dot. 
seeing Haku lying down on the ground and Cheyenne raising his fist up in the air comedically in front of them, the adventurers and the receptionist were at a loss for words. They couldn't find anything to say. They finally understood why Cheyenne had made the darkness. They shiver went down their backs at the same time. They didn't even notice that their hats were taken. It wasn't even a game. 100% of them were relieved that they didn't start going against them, and that it ended without any of them getting hurt. CH8, Pair of Darkness Users As Cheyenne finished registering at the guild and was about to leave, he was surprised at the line that had formed behind him. Em, would you be willing to be in a party with us? We're looking for someone who could use darkness magic. Let's try a quest together. You never know until you try. It wasn't surprising, as Cheyenne would be an immediate asset and had a strong familiar as well, for the other adventurers to try to recruit him. But Cheyenne shook his head without a thought. Sorry, but I'm planning to move with Haku for a while. Cheyenne let out a small sigh as he exited the guild. Forming a party with people was too hard on his mind. He didn't want to feel the pain of trusting someone and getting betrayed again. He found a good companion called Haku, but his emotional wounds hadn't healed yet. We've still got money, so let's go find a room to spend the night in. I'm the problem, aren't I? Should I go sleep outside the city? No, if I remember correctly, there's an in that lets familiars stay as well. It must be more expensive then. I'll earn lots of money starting tomorrow. Anyways. Haku raised his head high and looked around. He checked the shadows of buildings, and cocked his head as he saw that there was no one there. Do you feel that we're being watched? Yes, that's it. Ever since we entered the city. Is it the Hero of Divine Eyes? To be honest, I've been feeling it since two years ago. For that long. It wasn't constant, but he had felt someone watching him since he was the Hero of Darkness. And Cheyenne had a good idea of who the culprit was. I heard that the Hero of Divine Eyes changed two years ago. So the new hero is keeping an eye on you? But you were on a different continent two years ago, right? The range of his sight is that wide? Either his abilities are incredible, or it was someone or something unrelated to the hero. There were a lot of people that wanted to keep an eye on me. It was so between the heroes, and also for those with authority and ordinary people as well. After hearing that Haku went silent, and eventually spoke to him in a soft voice. Do you mind if I go gather some information? There's a lot of things I want to know about, including heroes. Sure, but are you okay going all by yourself? Yes. I'll trace your scent once I'm done. Got it. I'll see you later. Cheyenne looked around at the city while looking for the inn. He found a stand selling orc meat on a stick so he tried one. It was a bit hard, but it was chewy and tasted pretty good. The sauce was sweet and spicy, which made it better. He wanted to give some to Haku, so he bought around ten and put them in his darkness bag. He also bought a lot of fruit and put those in as well. He then saw a sign that said pets in and was relieved that his memory wasn't wrong. Inns that allowed familiars and pets were surprisingly in demand. There were many travelers who had pets such as dogs and beast tamers with familiars. When he opened the door, a slight scent of animals caught his nose. But Cheyenne smiled, thinking that it wasn't bad at all. He was about to see what kind of familiars there were when the counter caught his attention. You can take the full fee from us if you want. But we're in this city on the orders of our master. You're still not going to give us a discount? Ah man, we're going to have to report this to the hero. Even if you say so. A pair of bad-looking men were trying to get the owner to give them a discount. The owner didn't look like he wanted to, but he flinched at the word hero. Would it be the hero of divine eyes? No, but don't be surprised. Our master is, the hero of darkness, Master Axe. Noise started to erupt from the customers in the room, and the owner's face distorted. The name of the hero of darkness had influence, even in Oregon, which was famous for the hero of divine eyes. But the owner was also a businessman. He got himself together and started to question them. Do you have any proof? There's people like you every now and then. Customers who selfishly use the name of heroes. Of course, I'm not saying that you are. That's basically saying that we are. Rude. Cheyenne had anger building up in his eyes as he watched their oppressive attitudes. 
he had nothing to do with them. He tried to stop them, but a customer with a sense of justice moved before him. Stop it. Apprentices of heroes shouldn't be acting like thugs. Are you even apprentices of Master Axe in the first place? Where's the proof? We'll show you right now. Only one of them answered with a smile, but both of them started moving. They activated a spell at almost the same time, and their hands were surrounded by a swaying darkness. The spell, which looked like dark flames, was a darkness magic called black coating. The two of them grabbed onto the man suddenly with their black hands. Here you go. Ugh, stop. What is this, by strength? It's a very powerful darkness magic. It's your fault, by the way. Stop. Cheyenne intervened since it was a dangerous spell that sucked away the opponent's mana. The two let go of the man, but he collapsed from having a large portion of his mana taken away. Damn, we got interrupted again. Whatever. So, owner. Do you believe that we're apprentices of Master Axe now? Why yes. You don't have to pay, so please go. He, thanks. See you. The two thugs patted Cheyenne's shoulder lightly and tried to walk past him. For a moment, Cheyenne couldn't decide what to do. If he should let them go or not. Not long ago, when he still had the hero's ring, he wouldn't have had second thoughts. But right now, he wasn't even close to being anything, much less a hero. He found out not long ago that getting rid of all the sadness in the world was unachievable. Wait. Even so, Cheyenne faced forward. That magic. Try it on me. He couldn't change the world. He couldn't get rid of sadness either. He was betrayed by the companions he trusted. But still, the young man named Cheyenne Axe wasn't one that could ignore injustice happening in front of his eyes. CH9, Mana Overload When Cheyenne became the Hero of Darkness at the age of 12, he made a big goal. He thought maybe he could get rid of the sadness in the world caused by evil and greed. He didn't want anyone to experience the suffering of losing his family as he did. He also swore to defeat the demon lord that was bringing calamity to humans. But Cheyenne thought that even after over ten years, he couldn't bring any significant change. Was he naive? Did he not have enough resolve? Or maybe he wasn't strong enough? No matter how much he pondered it he couldn't find an answer, but there was one thing that he realized. In his sight was a young girl giving a worried look at her father, and the look in her eyes was like his own on that day. She was the daughter of the owner. Her eyes were laced with sorrow as she watched her father droop at the men's unfair methods. The strong can exploit the weak. The beautiful can despise what isn't. Those in the high class can use those who are not like tools. I've always hated that way of thinking. Huh, so? That powerful darkness magic of yours, you learned it so you won't have to pay for your rooms. That's cool. Hey buddy, you wanna become like that guy on the floor? Try it if you can. That's what I said earlier. The men's faces stiffened as Cheyenne taunted them, and they immediately started moving to subdue him. A few seconds later their hands were painted black and grabbed onto their target. Cheyenne didn't show any resistance, and only felt empty and downhearted inside. In the history of any time or country, many of the people who had the aptitude for using darkness magic were villains. Some generations of the darkness hero had even sided with the demon lord. Because of that, the element hero that was most hated by the people was the hero of darkness. Cheyenne and the former hero had worked hard to wipe that reputation, but there were still many villains among darkness users. Judging from their activation speed, the two seemed quite skilled. They probably could have made a decent living without doing this kind of thing, but why did they choose to do so? I don't care about others as long as I'm fine with it. I've seen many people who destroyed themselves thinking like that. What, this guy? Why is he fine? We should be draining his mana. The two of them started feeling fear, seeing that Cheyenne didn't even bat an eye even though they were draining his mana with all their might. If your mana dries up, you could end up like the guy on the floor, but do you know what happens when the opposite happens? Oh opposite? A person has an amount of mana they could tolerate at once. A small amount of poison could become medicine, but too much will be harmful. Ugh. Blea. The two started staggering backwards and started writhing in pain. 
It passed the critical point. Looks like you couldn't absorb it all. I don't feel good and this headache is killing me, please, stop it. It's just mana overload. You'll feel better after half a day. I can't stand this. Please, I'll even pay you. Wondering if he was being soft on them, Cheyenne used black coating to drain their mana and alleviate the symptoms. He also did it thinking that they would be in the way of business. Clean the floor, make sure to pay, and apologize. Oh okay, we're really sorry. The men cleaned, paid, and apologized like they were different men than before, and left the inn, bowing their heads towards Cheyenne. Before the owner could thank him, the girl ran to Cheyenne and squeezed his hand. Oni I tan, thanks. You're welcome. A gentle feeling flowed throughout the room as Cheyenne gave the girl a broad smile and picked her up in his arm. At that moment, Haku came back. Oh, there you are. I'm done gathering information. Impressed at how fast he was, Cheyenne asked the owner if there was a room he and Haku could use. Of course. You're our savior so I'll give you a 30% discount. Thank you. I'm not sure what happened, but it looks like you did something good. As expected of you. After deciding to stay for a night, including meals, Cheyenne and Haku went to their room. It was a spatial room with nothing but the necessary furniture. Letting large familiars rest comfortably must have been taken into consideration. So, what kind of useful information did you get? About the Hero of Divine Eyes. I found someone that looked like an information broker and surprised, asked him and he told me some good things. I bet you showed him a scary face or something. That would make anyone start talking. Foo foo foo. So, it seems like the Hero of Divine Eyes had been gathering information on you for a while. As I thought. A few heroes, to be exact. All of them are popular and are considered to be the strongest. Hmm. Since they operated in different areas, it was rare for heroes to meet each other. But their relationships were complicated. Some would be hostile to others, while some would try to join forces, and some would try to make subordinates out of the others. Well, no use worrying. If he makes a move, I'll take it straight on. I think you'll be fine, but do you want to look for your lost powers just in case? I can sense where the magic stealing stones are at. But for the time being, let's work on guild quests. Got it. Alright, this is for gathering good information. When Cheyenne pulled out the ogre meat on skewers and the fruit that he had bought earlier, Haku jumped up, barely missing the ceiling, enjoy. Can I eat all of this? Dig in. Who, this meat is so tender and good. Seeing Haku cleverly take the meat off the skewer and munching on it was heartwarming, but Cheyenne was puzzled. Tender? Aren't they a bit hard? Em, they're really tender and good. I see. It was quite simple. The jaw strength of humans was nothing compared to Haku's. Seeing him enjoying the hard ogre meat, he decided to give him some as a present later. The fruit were gone in the blink of an eye as well, and Haku licked his mouth clean. He looked like he didn't have enough. Oni I tan, dinner is ready. Thanks for calling us. Yeah. The young girl from before came all the way here to tell them that. Haku stood up and started walking out without even looking at her. Hurry, let's go to the dining hall, Oni I tan. Ah, man. Cheyenne smiled, thinking that he needed to make a lot of money starting tomorrow. CH10, Collecting Valuable Herbs Inside the Adventurer's Guild Cheyenne and Haku were looking at the E-rank wooden tags hung on the billboard. They could only go on quests that matched their rank so they were all lackluster to them. I guess we could go collect herbs and mushrooms. Let's do this goblin exterminating one too. I guess we could. They took the quest of acquiring two goblin wrists on top of collecting mule herbs and striped mushrooms. The receptionist frowned, even though they were easy quests. I don't recommend going into the mountain right now. A dangerous monster called a Triserpent had started dwelling in the mountain since a week ago. One of our beer rank parties departed this morning. Some capable adventurers had gone out because the villages and towns would be in danger if it ever came down. Then we'll be careful not to encounter it. So you're still going? I had a feeling you would say that. I have Haku with me, so we'll manage. I don't think you would have a problem with the mushrooms and goblins, 
but your herbs look very similar to poisonous herbs. We have a contract with the botanist asterisk so it's okay to bring whatever you find. Got it. Other adventurers did so most of the time as well. There weren't many that were knowledgeable about herbs. After they exited the guild, Cheyenne checked how much money he had on hand and counted 150,000 gowns. It wouldn't be enough for two months even if they were frugal. Having a weapon seems like a dream. But you have me. You don't have a weapon either, though. Of course I do. My heart will always be holding a sword. I'll admit that wanting to say cool things spirit of yours. Mufufu. M.T. Kinos, a mountain famous for having an abundant amount of herbs, was a few hours away by foot, but it was different for the strong legs of a magical beast. Cheyenne entered the mountain while on top of Haku, and darted up the mountain. They soon found goblins fighting over territory in the middle of the animal trail. Was it two wrists? Yeah. Then those will do. Jai? Gaia. The goblins, noticing Haku running towards them, starting attacking him from both sides. But they weren't a match for a white fox, and were torn to shreds by a swipe of his claws. Out of the dispersing pieces of flesh flying through the air, Cheyenne caught four wrists and stored them in his darkness bag. Nice catch Cheyenne. Nice attack. We can leave the goblins alone now. Then let's head to a river. They left the other parts since they couldn't be sold, and started moving towards a river. Their goal wasn't the river, but the striped mushrooms that grew near rivers. There weren't any poisonous mushrooms that looked similar, so Cheyenne gathered a bunch while Haku bathed in the river. Kia Kia, Cheyenne. The water feels so good. Hey Haku, there's a triserpent in this mountain. I don't think you should make so much noise. But it feels so good, see? Although Cheyenne tried to act mature, as Haku used his tail and legs to splash water on him, it triggered Cheyenne's childishness. You've really done it now. Take this. Oh. You're pretty good. I'm pretty good at water tag, you know. Fufufu, try to catch me. What the? Haku's swimming speed was incredible. How could he be so fast when he's dog paddling? There wasn't anyone to announce the start, but the game had already started, with Haku and Cheyenne swimming with all their might. Three hours later. The team, completely soaked, remembered their goal and continued their climb. Achoo! Achoo! We played too much. You're right. Slightly regretting doing so without even remembering to eat, they reached a large patch of herbs. The whole area was covered in similar-looking herbs. Looking like the same herb, even when looked at carefully, was a nuisance. Mixed in there with the Yule herbs were many poisonous herbs. You want to pick some randomly? That's inefficient, and there's a chance that all of them are poisonous herbs. I'll tell them apart. Cheyenne gripped one of the leaves and started rubbing it. He was telling them apart by the slight roughness of the leaves. Cheyenne could utilize this method because of his delicate senses. This should be enough. As expected of a former hero, being an expert on herbs as well. It's not my knowledge. It's knowledge I took from a bandit with magic called black coating. You can take knowledge? The thugs at the end the other day could only take mana, but Cheyenne could steal his opponent's knowledge as well. But it consumed a large portion of his mana, and his head would become weird if the opponent had an extensive amount of knowledge. He could also be attacked by illness, so it wasn't a spell that he could use often. I can't use it with my current powers though. But it's still quite versatile. Could you take memories as well? Never tried, but probably. Then could you take all my painful memories? No way. I already have too many of my own. That's true. After sharing a laugh, Cheyenne turned to climb back down the mountain. But Haku was facing in a different direction. Can you go on without me? I've got something to do. I can help you now. No, there's no need for that. It's about earning my keep, anyway. I'm not too sure what you mean, but be careful. Of course. I'll see you later. After seeing off Haku run up towards the peak, Cheyenne attempted to use a certain spell. Looks like it doesn't work. It was a darkness spell called Black Door which let him leap through space, but it was currently lost, so he gave up and walked back to Oregon. 
When he reached the guild, he submitted Goblin's Wrist X4, Striped Mushroom X12, and Yule Herb X4. But the receptionist had a bad reaction when she saw the herbs. Um, Mr. Cheyenne? With only four, there's a high chance of all of them being poisonous. It's probably fine. I'll hand them over to the expert just in case. The expert was visiting right then so it wasn't long before the appraisal results came back. The receptionist was talking to the expert with a surprised look on her face, then returned to the counter where Cheyenne was. T. They were all Yule herbs. I'm glad. You know a lot about herbs as well. Just a little bit. That's so cool, a darkness magic user, strong, and completing quests perfectly. A super excellent adventurer. My name is Lily, and I'm looking forward to working with you for many years to come. Slightly baffled at Lily, who suddenly got closer, Cheyenne managed to make a smile. But the smile crumbled when he heard the words, just like Master Axe. CH11, Colored Fox. Near the peak of M.T. Kinos, amid a sea of conifers, the third branch B-rank party Gold Helm was facing off against the Triserpent. Gold Helm consisted of four members, two men in their forties and a man and woman in their twenties, and they had many achievements, surprising for a party that had only been together for three years. The front line was Dole, who wielded a shield, the swordsman Gaul, and the lance wielder Yuna. The leader Felm was skilled with lightning magic and was the finisher. They had a certain pattern for battle. The three in the front line kept their opponents busy as well as exhaust them, and Felm delivered a powerful spell to finish them off. They climbed all the way to Birank using this method. Hearing that the Triserpent was a formidable foe but thinking there would be no problem, that was their mistake. Whoa! So hot! Ah! The three frontliners weren't functioning properly at all. Cold sweat ran down Felm's forehead as he watched the three of them from behind. First, their opponent, the snake monster, was a variant species. It had one tail, but it split from its torso into three necks and with a head on each of them. Although it was taller than a human, it was barely three meters high, and wasn't enough to dampen their spirits. But the three heads, which could be considered its main characteristic, was the most troublesome part. Each head had different skills, and on top of showing moves such as breathing fire, spitting poison, and shooting sticky liquid, its scales were so hard that Gaul and Yuna's weapons couldn't penetrate them. It's not like we were underestimating the variant species. Some species of monsters had strong individuals and variant species, and while the former could be considered a higher version of the original species, with similar actions and ways of fighting, but the latter were almost always unique. The Triserpent was certainly a powerful foe. It was on a level that required the members of Gold Helm to be coordinated at their best in order to defeat it. But currently the party had a problem. Hey Gaul, don't run into me. You were standing where I was going to dodge to. Do you want to kill me that bad? What did you just say? What do you want? Give me a break, both of you. Felm wanted to scream as he watched the three of them while shaping his mana into a powerful spell. The two young members, Gaul and Yuna, were lovers, but yesterday Yuna found out that Gaul was having an affair, so an awkward rift had erupted between them. They were skilled and capable, but their mentalities were still quite immature, being young, so Felm and Dole, who were older, had always kept them under control. But this time, the cut was deep. Focus on fighting for now, you idiots. Keep it busy for thirty more seconds, I'll finish it. As Felm shouted out, not being able to keep his agitation in anymore, the pair's movements returned to normal. But their hands were still full just trying to dodge the serpent's attacks. Dole blocked the searing flames from one head with a shield, but another head immediately sprayed liquid everywhere. It was aiming for their feet, so they had to continue moving around. The liquid was sticky, so if they got caught, they wouldn't be able to move. You ready yet, leader? Hurry up, we won't last any longer. How is it film? You ready? Yeah, I'm ready. Thanks for waiting. The three's expressions lightened at Felm's firm answer. They scattered, convinced that it was the gospel of victory, and as soon as they did, Felm unleashed the most powerful spell in his arsenal, double lightning. Not a single opponent had been able to dodge the lightning that raced down from the clouds. That was Felm's pride, and the record still stood. 
the yellow lightning struck the triserpent, followed up by another strike by a blue one. The second one had a strong paralysis effect, so the fight came to an end. Crew! The members of Gold Helm made a grave misunderstanding. The sound coming from the triserpent wasn't a scream of pain, but a laugh of disdain. Gie! Ugh! What's wrong? The three in front all sank to their knees and started to spasm. It was difficult for them to even reply, and Felm looked around for the cause, and recalled that one of the serpent's heads had its mouth open the whole time. It spat out a neurotoxin, damn it. It wasn't a problem of noticing or not noticing. Even if they knew what it was trying to do, they wouldn't have been able to deal with it and would have ended up in the same situation. And Felm currently faced one of the most difficult choices he had to make in his whole career as an adventurer. His body still moved since he was standing in the back. How to make use of this fact was the decision he had to make. Leave his companions and run away, or go try to save them, knowing he could lose his life. He knew what his answer was. I'd rather die than leave them here. The belief that forming a party meant they were in the same boat existed in Felm's heart. So he would fight, but he shook. No matter how many times he tried to brace himself, his instincts complained that he didn't want to die, so all he could do was stand there with his knees shaking uncontrollably. Pathetic. Even so, he tried shaping his mana through all the embarrassment, but it didn't go well. His fear was getting in the way of activating his spell. When he glanced in front of him, he saw that the triserpent was trembling slightly. At first, he thought it was making fun of them, but that didn't seem to be the case. In the direction of where all the heads were looking at, stood a monster that he had never seen before. It was a magical beast with brilliant yellow fur, and electric discharges erupted from its enormous body intermittently. Magic wolf, no, a magic fox? Felm concluded, even though he was confused at how large it was. Its overwhelming presence wasn't something a normal monster could emit, and it appeared on the trembling triserpent as well. Do you mind if I defeat this? Felm took a step back in surprise as it spoke to him. Oh of course. I would rather have you defeat it for us. Okay, then. Before it even finished talking, a few bolts of lightning shot out from the yellow fox's body. The bolts, at a speed that made it difficult for human eyes to follow, all hit the triserpent, and although Felm could see that they were powerful, he couldn't help but shout out. It's no good. It has lightning resistance. It won't have any effect. It did, didn't it? Huh. The triserpent collapsed and didn't move an inch, making it obvious that it was either dead or unconscious. The yellow fox walked next to it to confirm and said in a happy voice. It's dead. After all, I'll be taking this. The yellow fox picked the monster in its jaws and ran off, with a lightness that even the wind couldn't follow it. For a while, Felm was stunned, even forgetting to help his companions. Although it was a different species, he couldn't help but admire its beautiful fur and posture, and its overwhelming strength. CH12, Surprised Guild Master After receiving the quest rewards and payment for the Yule Herbs, Cheyenne's wallet was a lot heavier. When he checked his balance at the guild, it had increased to 350,000 gowns. He was trying hard not to smile. He was wondering whether he should save up a little bit more and buy a weapon. He wanted magic items like the ones he used when he was the Hero of Darkness. But he wasn't going to ask too much. Those were worth billions, and were on the same level as royal treasures, so there was no way he could purchase them. Are you here Cheyenne? As Haku entered the guild with an excited voice, the adventurers around him started talking among themselves. It was an expected response, as there was an unbelievable monster within his jaws. Haku, what's that monster? I think this is the monster that we were told that settled down in the mountain. The Triserpent, ha. Huh? It does look like one. The guild employees including Lily ran towards them and started examining it to see if it was actually the Triserpent. The adventurers knew from a glance that it was a very dangerous monster and was reminded how extraordinary Haku was. That's familiar is incredible. I want one too. No way you could. You know, Cheyenne is incredible as well, taming a monster like that. Isn't that pair already the strongest in Oregon? It wouldn't be surprising if they got scouted by lords and such. Next to them, the employees judged that it was indeed the real monster, and Lily brought the guild master from the back. 
Cheyenne's brows rose slightly as he saw that the guild master of the third branch as a woman in her late twenties. She was tall with abundant red hair, and wore clothes exposing lots of skin, preferred by fighters. Before looking at the Triserpent, she turned her gaze towards Cheyenne and Haku. So, you two are the super rookies that joined yesterday? I'm Cheyenne. You've got a cute face. Totally my type. Master, you can't. The guild master laughed and said she knew, as Lily looked at her with cold eyes. Anyways, come to my office. Let's talk. Leaving the monster to the employees, Cheyenne and Haku headed to the room in the back. The door was small, so Haku barely squeezed through. Can you make the doors bigger? Ha, ah, we never expected someone like you. Sorry I'm so big. The guild master sat down on a couch, and Cheyenne sat on the one across the table. She first took out a special guild card and showed him that she was the boss. I'm Roan, the one who runs this branch. Could you explain what happened? It'll be a bit long. Although Haku said so, his story wasn't that long at all. He explained that when he found the Triserpent, there was a party having a hard time dealing with it, so he asked if he could defeat it. That's our gold helm. Thank you so much for saving them. It was nothing. I can't pay you the rewards since you didn't take the quest, but I want to thank you somehow. How about you let us buy the monster? The market price at the resource store would be six, seven million, but we'll pay eight. That much. It's a variant species. Its fangs and fluids could be used for equipment and things like that. Deal? Cheyenne's the one who makes the decisions, so you'd better ask him. So, how about it, Mr. Owner? Cheyenne didn't talk for a moment. He wondered if it was better to take the materials and have some equipment crafted rather than sell it all. Many good materials could be found from variant or strong species of monsters. Roan seemed to have misunderstood his silence as a part of the negotiation, as she clapped her hands. Okay. There's the matter of Gold Helm, and I'd like you to be here as long as you could, so I'll give you ten million. On top of that, I'll specially bring you up to Sirank. How about that? Huh. Oh, ah, uh, hey Haku, was that monster strong? Just a bit stronger than a goblin, I think. There's no way. Roan couldn't help but interrupt. So Haku decided to make an upward revision. I think it was similar to a high rank goblin nut. Then I guess it wasn't much at all. Yeah, I defeated it with a weak attack. Okay then master, you got a deal. It's not every day that you find people that aren't normal just by hearing them talk, you know. A strong species of high rank goblin could wipe out a whole group of experienced adventurers. Rome couldn't hide her disbelief because she knew that. Judging that she didn't want to get on their bad side, Roan gave them the ten million in cash with a smile on her face. Help me out when I'm in trouble, okay? Being seen out by Roan, who was in a good mood for some reason, Cheyenne walked out of the guild. Money is power. Since their funds had increased, both Cheyenne and Haku walked down the street happily. Well done Haku. I don't just want to be a pet waiting to be fed. I aspire to be an honorable beast that could feed himself. That's what you say, but I'm guessing you were worried about that party. Some sort of sharp intuition came into play, and you went to help them, right? You're so cool, Akuko. While you saw right through me. In the bottom of his heart, the rock bottom, Haku swore to himself that he wouldn't admit that he just wanted money so he could eat as much as he wanted to, no matter what. CH13, let's join the Life Guild. The day after they had received the great sum of money for their work, Cheyenne let out a worried sigh as he looked at Haku eat breakfast at the corner of his eye. What should I do? Mogu Mogu are we Mogu Mogu going Mogu to Mogu Mogu the Mogu Guild Mogu again Mogu Mogu? Asterisk Mogu equals chewing. What kind of code are you talking in? Haku smiled as he swallowed the meat. The meat here is so good. Are we going to the guild again today? I was wondering if I should go buy weapons or search for the magic absorption stones. So, you've decided to search for them. A spell that I want to use got sealed. One of them doesn't seem to be far from here, so I thought looking for it would be okay. But not having a weapon is kind of lonely too. We have the money so let's go buy one. Cheyenne decided to go to the equipment shop since Haku encouraged him to. 
He went inside the shop, leaving Haku to wait outside, and was slightly surprised to see so many customers even though it was morning. Getting equipment before going hunting, ha! Huh? Cheyenne looked at a red curved sword hanging on the wall and shook his head. The blade's curve was too deep for him to use. Many blacksmiths forged unique swords, but most of them weren't meant for battle. Even if it were an excellent blacksmith, there were hits and misses, so the ability to see through them will be tested. He asked the store owner, who looked to be in his late thirties, if he had any magic swords. What's your budget? A few hundred thousand. That's pretty hard. It'll be mediocre ones. I can't buy it right now, but can you show me the best one in the store? The owner nodded and brought out a sword from the back with confidence. The blade was on the thin side, but he could see that the material was good, and it wouldn't snap easily, and the grip was decorated with gold and small gems. Flashy swords that seemed like something royalty would like were usually just for show, but Cheyenne could tell that this one wasn't. A magic item. Wind type. You can tell just from a look. You're not an ordinary guy. I used to be a mercenary, so I can tell if one is weak or strong just by the way they walk and breathe. Talking from experience, lots of wind types had been in forms similar to this, so. That's right, and this one could shoot out shock waves made of wind. It'll take the user's mana though, of course. It was an excellent weapon because one could use it even if he didn't have aptitude for the wind attribute. After asking for details from the owner, Cheyenne thanked him. Thank you so much. Come back any time. As Cheyenne walked down the stairs of the shop, we wondered if asking for so much was arrogant. To be honest, his heart wasn't attracted to that weapon. Part of it was because his previous weapon was too strong, but Cheyenne could use up to intermediate wind magic. He felt like there wasn't a need to use a sword for that. After he told Haku he couldn't find anything good, an unexpected response came back. Then let's go to the Life Guild. Do you know of it? Yeah, I've heard of it. Fufufu, I'll tell you all about it. The Life Guild was similar to the Adventurer's Guild but most of the quests were for within the city. There were quests from babysitting children to preparing meals, which were difficult to ask adventurers to do. Housewives and people who weren't confident strong fighters but have special skills could make money. Wouldn't adventurers make more? The Life Guild is connected to the Magic Item Association. The system is a bit special as well. Let's go take a look. It seemed interesting so Cheyenne started walking towards it. It was a fancy-looking building made of bricks in a corner of the commercial area, and the atmosphere made it so that it was easy for women to enter. Inside, there were several front desks separated by boards, and ordinary people were there being consulted. W. Welcome. The man at the desk looked at Haku with fear. He's my familiar, so it's okay. Sorry I'm so large. Dot. The man's fear seemed to melt as he saw Haku's frank attitude. Cheyenne first asked him to explain the rules of the Life Guild. It seemed to be the following. Two types of quests, one being from individuals, the other from the guild. The former was mostly helping out, while the latter was gathering items slash ingredients or solving problems. Rewards were given in points, not money. Points could be exchanged for ingredients and items. It could be exchanged for money, but the rates weren't good. There weren't ranks, but those who were capable were treated better. Registering was easy, but you would get fired if you continued to fail quests. After hearing the explanation, Shio's heart fluttered. Apparently, the things that you could exchange with points included powerful magic items. As expected from an organization with connections to the Magic Item Association. When he told the man he wanted to register, he was very happy to hear that. There's been many problems lately so experienced people are very thankful to have. My name is Sablin. I'm 42 with a wife and children, and I've been working here for 25 years. A veteran, I see. My name is Cheyenne, and this is my partner Haku. Actually, I'm looking for a sword right now. Can I take a look at the exchange list? Of course. Knowing that motivation was important, Sablin showed Cheyenne the list of the items that were currently tradable. The list changes monthly. And the items will disappear from the list if someone else trades it. I see, whoa! Moonless Night Blade Altsaber. 8 million p. 
This sword was a famous one, with resistance to darkness magic as well as being very hard to break. Its cost was very high, but Cheyenne was determined to get his hands on it no matter what. Aya. Haku, who was peeking over his shoulder, became high tension as well. Two kilograms illusion boar meat. One million p. It was meat of a rare monster that was famous for being very tasty. Although they were looking at different things, strong flames of greed started burning within their eyes. Seeing it, Sablin smiled on the inside, knowing that his plan had worked. He was quite the businessman. CH-14, The Magic Pickpocket Seeing the young man with a beast of immense aura, even an idiot could see that he was different from others. Sablin, who was a veteran at the job, always looked at his customer and recommended jobs that fit their level, so he didn't feel like making Cheyenne do something like pick up garbage or go on patrol. Mr. Cheyenne, how would you like to try a job as practice? Yes, please. Usually we would have you start at jobs that are worth a few hundred points, but you two are aiming for expensive items. So, how about these? Sablin showed them jobs with very hard difficulty, knowing he had nothing to lose. Help restarting the fountain. 1 million p. Capture the uncatchable pickpocket. 3 million p. Case of the stolen magic tools. 6 million p. All of them were unsolved for over a year, and for the pickpocket, even the lord of the land had given up on catching him. The magic tools had been stolen in a flashy manner but the culprit hasn't even been identified. Ten million if we clear all of them, ha! Huh? That makes my imagination run wild. But all of them are several times more difficult than others. In any case, we'll try them out. I guess we could start with the fountain. I'll guide you there. Sablin took Cheyenne and Haku to a park in the residential area. There were many children and housewives, and everything was slow and peaceful but the fountain in the center wasn't working. The client is a group called the Clean Club. There is a magic stone fit into that stone device, and it powers the device to spray water. But it requires a tremendous amount of energy. The mana in the magic stone had completely depleted over a year ago, and it had been just decoration for over a year. We used magic absorption stones to make the magic stone, but normal people don't have the amount of mana needed to start the fountain again. Mana and powers poured into magic absorption stones didn't come back. Cheyenne was already weakened so he wanted to avoid losing any more of his strength. Haku realized that and offered to do it himself. Let me try. Are you sure Haku? I'll just try putting in a little bit, so it won't affect me at all. Then please, Mr. Haku. Haku touched the stone that Sablin had brought and poured in less than a very small fraction of his total mana. The stone started to glow slightly, indicating that mana had been stored. Let's put it into the device and see if it works. Sablin walked in knee-deep water towards the stone device and put the stone in, in. Water spouted out high into the air. It meant that it was a great success. Woaha! It looks like it's working now, Dot. Good job. You're incredible, Mr. Haku. Sablin danced with joy because in fact, if the one who got the job mediated to him succeeded, it led to the reputation of the mediator to increase as well. It was very rare for someone that could succeed in one million P quests to show up. Your mana must be different than humans in both amount and quality. So, we can receive one million points just for that? Of course. I'll record it right now. Gaining a million points meant that Haku could trade it for the boar meat he was after. But when Cheyenne congratulated him, he shook his head. Let's focus on your weapon first. I don't mind getting what I want after. Okay, let's get on with the next quest. Dot. I'll guide you there. The next quest was the uncatchable pickpocket. The client was a prideful noble and had sent out a quest with a large sum of money in hopes of putting the bastard that stole his wallet in prison. Three million was way more than the reward for the previous quest, but it was that more difficult. Cheyenne and Haku stood in the corner of a large street with Sablin, who was looking into the crowd to search for the culprit. This seems like a job more suited for someone from the Adventurer's Guild, doesn't it? It would be impossible. The culprit is an infamous pickpocket. His name and face are known, but no one could catch him. If he were strong, 
he would make money more efficiently doing something else, so I'm guessing he has a special way of escaping. You have a keen eye, Mr. Cheyenne, as I had thought. The culprit Satsuro is very good at perceiving presences, and even when he's driven to the edge, he suddenly disappears. Space magic, I think. I'm not familiar with magic, so I'm not sure, but even excellent soldiers and adventurers haven't been able to catch, there he is. Sablin pointed to a middle-aged man with a shaved head, moving quickly among the crowd. Cheyenne narrowed his eyes as he saw the man take a wallet from the pocket of a passing person. That man, he just stole one. As expected, I guess. All right, let's go after him quietly. As they started tailing Satsuro, he went into the park from before and stopped in front of the fixed fountain. Ha, huh, someone fixed the magic stone. I guess there's some weird people out there. After muttering to himself, he checked the inside of the wallet he had stolen and raised his fist. Yeah, jackpot, hm. Satsuro turned around, feeling someone behind him, and almost fell over in surprise. WWW what are you guys? What do you want? He was surprised seeing Cheyenne and Sablin, but he was completely afraid of Haku's expression, which looked like he was looking forward to eating him. In fact, this was Haku smiling that they would be making more points. M more pursuers? With such a beast with you too. Your deeds of evil are done now Satsuro. This time won't go the same way as it's always been. Satsuro's pride was triggered at Sablin's confidence. So, you're saying that those guys could catch me, huh? Please, Mr. Cheyenne, Haku. Deciding that capturing the man came first, Cheyenne was about to use magic, but his eyebrows twitched at the unexpected situation. Strangely, Satsuro's figure started becoming more and more transparent. Ha ah, ha nice try. It doesn't matter how strong you are. Try breaking through this unstoppable ability if you can. Saying that, Satsuro completely disappeared. CH-15, Shadow Clone Trap The pickpocket disappeared. But it wasn't movement magic. Cheyenne guessed that it was a spell or magic item that made turn the body transparent. He could tell it was high level since his shadow disappeared as well. He tried to listen to footsteps but it was very difficult to tell among the sounds from the fountain as well as the children playing in the area. Between the five senses, humans relied most on their sight, so it wasn't surprising that even experienced adventurers would be baffled. But this time he was just too outclassed. There was someone among the Demon Lord's subordinates that used similar magic, and Cheyenne knew how to counter it. He was just wondering which method he should use. How about, oh! Haku dashed forward. With lightning speed, he dashed around something, cutting off its path, and roared sharply. A cry erupted from an empty space. Haku pushed down on that space with his paw and told Cheyenne that it was over. It seems like he's over here. Dot. You could see me. No, I can't. Then how did you know? Smell. Beasts have better noses than humans. Your sense of smell. Can you become visible again? I might accidentally bite you since I can't see you. Nom nom nom, you know? Okay so don't bite me. As Satsuro revealed himself, Savalan immediately tied him with a rope so he couldn't run. There was no way Satsuro could get himself out and acknowledged his defeat. Another great job Mr. Haku. Well done seeing through his invisibility magic. Was that magic? No, it's probably that ring. What Cheyenne indicated was correct, and a troubled look appeared on Satsuro's face. It was because if they continued thinking it was magic, he could look for an opening and escape. But since invisibility magic was classified as light magic, there was no way some random pickpocket could learn it, and Cheyenne knew that. A normal pickpocket stole a random ring, found out about its properties, and used that power to become infamous, something like that? That's exactly right, I give up. They then took Satsuro to the guards. Although small time, he was a wanted man with a bounty on his head, so Cheyenne and Haku received 500,000 gowns as well as the 3 million P for the successful quest. They felt very warm inside at the unexpected bonus. To think that you two would be this capable. You already have 4 million points. I haven't done anything yet. It's all thanks to Haku. In any case, we don't see anyone gather so many points on their first day. 
If it's you too, you might be able to solve that case. It's the stolen magic items, right? This one is a bit complicated. A case where the culprit hadn't been found for years. Sablin sat down on a bench and told Cheyenne about the problem. The Life Guild had connections with the Magic Item Association. The founders were brothers, so they were connected with something more than profit. The Magic Item Association regularly sent needed magic items to cities. They sent prizes for the Life Guild as well as items for weapon shops, and orders from royalty and nobles. During transit, they were often raided and the good were taken. It happened within Oregon a few times a year. We don't know their methods either. Even if we put strong bodyguards, they are always killed. Their opponent must be quite strong, and they are an organization as well. It's as you say. The group is most likely the criminal syndicate Death God's Chains. Cheyenne had heard of them before. They hunted for magic items all over the world, and there were even rumors that they were planning to take over the world. Their sins were even greater since the leader was a human, not someone working under the demon lord. The culprit hasn't even been seen. Do the attacks always happen during the night, by any chance? It's as you say. Do you have any ideas? If they use darkness magic like I do, they would be able to do it without leaving a trace. But that would be on the assumption that the person would be quite skilled. When Cheyenne said he had a plan, Sablin quickly called the guild master and they started talking. Cheyenne told him his plan, and Sablin advised the master to put it in action. Surprised that a trusted employee went so far for this, the master agreed to do it. The plan was going to be carried out at two in the morning. Magic items were going to be moved from a different place to the equipment store, castle, and the life guild. From the previous occurrences, even if they tried to hide it, the information was always leaked, so they were going to take advantage of that. After the discussion, the sun was setting. Cheyenne first moved to the road that connected the life guild to the storage. Haku, do you sense anyone watching us? No. Same. We'll set the trap here. What kind? It's not much. This is it. In the clandestine back road, Cheyenne used the spell Shadow Clone and made another of himself. The looks, physique, clothing, and everything else was the same as Cheyenne was. Oh, I'm surprised. It can only move where the light doesn't reach, and disappears when hit by bright light, but on the other hand, it can do things like this. Sink under and keep watch. As soon as it received its order, the fake Cheyenne nodded and melted into the ground. If it isn't too far from me, I can give it orders. But the more clones I make, the weaker my power gets. There's a better surveillance type spell, but I can't use it right now, so I'll stick with this one. This is handy enough. How strong is one of them? Not even 10% as strong as I am. But I can make many of them. And even if they are defeated, the power just comes back to me, so there aren't any demerits. I see. It seems like the best choice for this plan as expected of the Hero of Darkness. Former Hero. And you've been doing all the work until now, so I've got to start doing things as well. Cracking his shoulders, Cheyenne planted his clone within the city of Oregon. CH-16, Black vs. Black Part 1. Why do parents choose their children's names? Why don't children question the fact that the name they will be called for the rest of their lives are chosen by their parents' whims? Gene too developed a strong dissatisfaction about his name ever since he could remember. You're named after a famous warrior of light. So, follow in his footsteps, all right? A strong hatred brewed within him as he saw his father smiling at him and wanted to kill him. Due to his name or maybe it was his nature, Gene didn't grow up healthily. He grew into a bad child, torturing living things before killing them, stepping on the weak, and stealing. Ironically, he had an aptitude to darkness, the opposite of light. Realizing this, Jean's malice grew even quicker. Ultimately, he killed his parents, using them as lab rats in his darkness magic experiments, then went on a journey, refreshed. Although he had been freed from his parents, Jean didn't throw away his name. In order to remember his rage, he committed a numerous amounts of crimes in the ten years of his journey. No one could match Jean until that day. At a small village that he had went to, there was a masked hero. 
On top of that, he used darkness magic, and upon hearing that, of course Jean wanted to test his power. He looked for an opportunity and attacked the hero, but was defeated. It was the first time ever that everything he did had no effect. You're going to change from today. Don't hurt anyone with that magic ever again. Promise me, there won't be a next time. Jean didn't forget those words which had been said to him three years ago. But he remembered them as fuel to his rage. In fact, he had killed others the next day. He needed to in order to get stronger. Half a year later, Jean was scouted by Chains of Death God and was currently a member of the organization. In a closed pub at the edge of Oregon. Jean was chugging down a glass. Then the door opened, and a tall man called out to him. A message from the boss. There was a movement at the storehouse. They might be moving magic items tonight. Boss, ha. Huh. Call him with his name, idiot. It's not like it's a crappy one like mine. There's no telling who could be listening. Don't say it. Anyways, I relayed the message. Do what you want. Jean spat on the ground after the man left. He wasn't a member of Chains of Death God, and the two of them interacted at a minimum. The man was a business partner of the organization and the boss, only connected by money. He drank the rest of his drink and walked out. The sun's rays didn't reach the city anymore. Darkness users were absurdly powerful at night. It was common for their mana and physical abilities to increase. On top of that, a privilege only they possessed, they were immune to mental attacks from magic as well as magic items. This meant that darkness users couldn't be brainwashed, and magic that caused mental disruptions didn't work. Which is why they were commonly chosen as spies. Jean moved near the Magic Item Association and Life Guild's joint storehouse and was completely submerged in the dark ground. The storehouse had a special key and if the password was incorrect, it would activate a lethal magic spell, so he couldn't force himself in. Waiting is so boring. Damn it. He endured it, knowing that he needed to be patient. If he continued to steal magic items and eventually became an executive in the organization, he could get his hands on items that would enhance his darkness magic. His dream was then to start off by killing the masked hero, then take over a city. He waited in the darkness for four hours. The time for him to move finally came. 1.30 at night, a group of three entered the storehouse, and 30 minutes later, they came out with three small carts. As if cued, a group of well-built bodyguards gathered around the entrance. If they stood at the entrance from the beginning, they would be announcing that magic items were going to be shipped out, so they had been scattered on purpose. Thanks for the useless effort. He he he. Changing the body into darkness and moving freely in the dark is called Dark Swim. An experienced user like Jean could move quickly and could be submerged for the whole night as well. Going beneath their feet and listening in on their conversation was easy. Alright, we can't let these magic items get stolen this time. Exactly. Sablin, we're counting on you. Leave it to me. A middle-aged man and two others. Jean's intuition worked. The man named Sablin was the one with the valuable magic items. The three of them, along with four or five bodyguards, pushed their carts in different directions. The ones other than Sablin are possibly fakes. The association wasn't stupid. They had already suffered losses many times, so they were trying hard to counteract the organization. The bodyguards should be strong as well. But your efforts are useless. Jean laughed as he silently followed Sablin. Five minutes later, they came across a place that was perfect for him to move out. It was a wide road, but since it wasn't a main road, it was one that people didn't follow during the night. Jean started off by taking care of the guards in the back. He jumped up from the stone tiles. He pulled out his sword. Then he swung at his defenseless neck as he came down. Dead, he was sure of it. But his mind was changed when he felt nothing on his blade. I didn't cut anything. He disappeared? No, it seemed that the guard was pulled into the shadow under his feet. He dove back into the shadows before Sablin and the other guards could see him, then he moved behind another guard. He attacked him the same way as before, but the same thing happened. The strange thing was that although they sunk into the shadows, they didn't come back up. Even though they didn't seem to be darkness users. Who's there? Damn it you saw me. Die then. 
he took out a knife and threw at the remaining guard, but before it could hit his forehead, he disappeared as well. What's happening? He shouted and went for Sablin, the only one left, but he was dragged into the shadows as well. A trap? Allies? Jean was greatly confused. He called out with caution. Are you an enemy or an ally make it clear? As soon as he said that, a silent answer came back. He turned around at an unbelievable presence, and a kick flew at him from a black-haired young man. He crossed his arms in front of him and guarded the blow, the kick was so strong it easily blew him back a few meters. This guy, is, strong. Every cell in Jean's body recognized the black-haired young man in front of him as a dangerous opponent. Black vs. Black Slash Part 2 Jean, who got kicked by the dark-haired boy, Cheyenne, wakes up with a Goran sound. After checking the opponent's face, he decided that he was not a friend because he did not recognize him, and entered the battle stance. The hell? Jean is not familiar with the path of the sword, but his swings are quick, so he can kill people more efficiently than moderate swordsmen. However, Cheyenne is able to counter his attack with a roundhouse kick. Ugh, what are you? A martial artist? The kick is powerful enough to numb one of his arms. Jean turns his back and starts running away. After confirming that Cheyenne is running after him, he used dark swimming at the right time. With this, he can go behind Cheyenne and slash him. As I thought, was it you earlier? Jean is convinced that it was Cheyenne who let the Sablins escape because the opponent also escaped by black swimming. Therefore, he activated the dark magic black hand, which he is good at, without a break. Jet black tentacles appear and extend long from the ground to catch the enemy. The fight will be over once he's captured. It is impossible to escape because of the vice. Furthermore, now that the sun is completely down, the power of the magic is jumping up due to the attribute aptitude bonus. Cheyenne moves zigzag trying to escape from the black hand. If an amateur sees it, it will appear as if he was running away. But Jean can see it through. He's trying to buy some time. Black Hand has a large magical power consumption, so they are aiming to exhaust their magical power by spending time doing so. Jean takes a pouch out of his pocket and swallows a pill from inside it. It's also called a double-edged pill, if you swallow one it will improve your physical and magical abilities, but it will shorten your lifespan by 10 years. But, considering his opponent, Jean thinks it's worth it. Urgaiwaiya his pupils opened, his muscles enlarge, and his eyes sharp and ready to kill. Jean's sudden enhance of his magical abilities made his dark magic much more vicious, powerful, and destructive. At the same time, ten black hands grew from the ground and attacked Cheyenne all at once. The speed is also increased and captured Cheyenne while he stopped for a second. Cheyenne, whose whole body has been grasped by black hand, couldn't move, and Jean took the chance. The blade ripped Cheyenne's heart. Ha, 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 what a shame. He seems to have considerable skills, but I'm far superior as Exp. Poof, Cheyenne's body disperses like a mist as if it were an afterimage. Before Jean can determine whether he won or not, he felt a presence on his back. Three people. The boy he stabbed earlier has now appeared with two of him from the darkness. No way, and no way, I shadow clone. He can't believe it, even though it's right in front of him. First of all, Jean can't use it, and even if he used it, the clones will be much weaker than the main body. However, the one he defeated earlier is strong enough to force him to use the dangerous pill. In any case, Jean is at a disadvantage as soon as three bodies appear at once. Even if he tries to deal with them with black hand, it's useless if there are many of them. Jean grips his hands so tight they're trembling. He's angry. It reminds him of that day when he thought he was a dragon, but he realized that he was a slug that crawls on the ground. What the hell, what the hell, what the hell, what the H-E-L-L-L. -L -L. There were four remaining magic drugs, and Jean swallowed them all together. In front of victory, health and life become cheap. Gawelwerg. Because of the way it is used out of its original purpose, the pain that is unbearable first erodes Jean's body. His eyes turn white drools all over himself, and the muscles causes cramps every minute. Even so, the power beyond the limit is waiting ahead. Dominated by an overwhelming sense of self-affirmation and invincibility, 
Jean is able to increase the power of his magic by several levels. The number of black hands, which was about ten, tripled and each one of them is thicker than before, accelerating its strength and attacking Cheyenne and his clones. The black hands were able to handle complicated movements, and successfully captured Cheyenne, twisted his neck, ripped his head, pierced his torso, and reduced all three to nothing. However, the battle isn't over yet. Another reinforcement, clones, appeared, and this time it's five bodies. Jean killed them all whilst roared in anger. However, when he crushed the fifth body, he noticed the fact that his back became pale and cold. There was no bloodlust from the clones. The first clone who gave the first shot had a will to fight, but after that, it was as if it was just to escape, no, it was focused only on buying some time. When he opened his mouth, Jean's body reached its limit and he vomited a lot of blood. The clones appeared again as if to fight it. Ack, F-U-C-K. Are you the real one? It seems that you chose the path of self-destruction, so I was able to do it. Ugh, this is irritating. You're a member from Chains of Death God, right? If so, what are you gonna do? How do you know about the movements inside the storehouse? If you're a dark user you should know it too, right? We have magic for observation and determine range. That's obviously a lie. Magic like that can't be used with someone of your level. There should be another person doing it for you. Anyone who can get a glimpse of it without being noticed by the other person. For example, the hero of Divine Eyes. Cheyenne dares to give the name and explore his heart, but Jean just smiles and doesn't seem to be upset. That stupid strength, you're the hero of darkness right? I'll know even without the mask. I've already quit. But when I was still a hero, I should have told you before. There's no next time. You remember? Ants like me? I remember every single promise I've made. The ones that I've fulfilled, and the ones that I've broken. Cheyenne's footsteps echo in the middle of the night. Whoosh, one of the black wings appeared making Jean excited even though he's already dying. Because it's a skill that no matter how much he wants it, he can't learn it. Even though his body is in such pain that his head going crazy, Jean can't stop pulling up the edge of his mouth. Jean too, that's my name. The F-U-C-K-I-N-G life that started while chasing after someone, the lie has been decided from the beginning. That is, to end the real thing, ha ha ha. There's nothing pleasant about this, one. What an idiot. Cheyenne chose to pierce his heart with his wing, not corrosion. Do the killing count as a punishment or mercy to escape unimaginable suffering? It was known only to Cheyenne who did it. Chapter 18 Even though the culprit died, Cheyenne got 6 million P for successfully achieved the objective. Being given high praises by the Guild Master of the Life Guild and Sablin, he will be given special treatment the next day. When he arrived at the room with Haku, there's a sword and 2 kg of meat on the table. It's the dark sword you want, alt saber, and 2 kg of wild boar meat. Sablin told them with a huge smile, and it widens more when he sees Cheyenne and Haku looks enticed by it. In addition, the reward is not only that, but there's one card that they are not familiar with is placed. The card will be explained by the head of the branch. This is a gift given only to special members. It is only given to those who have been rendered special person. It's only been a day since you registered but, I will take responsibility for giving you this card. It's that big of a problem the robbery incident is for the Life Guild. There are two main benefits for special card holders. One thing is that something called the back menu are added to the point exchange. It means that you can exchange rare magic tools and curiosities. And another thing, if you want to enter a town where there is a life guild, there is no need to pay the entry tax. This is because the guild will take care of it. Ooh, I've gotten great things. Precious monster materials such as unicorn horns are also on the back menu. Also, I think that there is also a special request from the guild. Can you help me with it? You can call me anytime. Please continue to have a good relationship with us. In addition to the exchanged items and cards, Cheyenne and Haku leave the guild with meat and vegetables. Who, we got a good haul. The town has become more peaceful too, and we get to save some more points. Let's exchange it. Meat. Meat, hee hee. 
Cheyenne thinks about how to cook boar meat while blowing out to Haku who is too happy to utter words correctly. 1. I heard that it is good just to roast it, but there is also another way to fry, and I felt like I wanted to ask a first-class chef anyway. If I recall correctly, his name is Mr. Edvin. It seems that the owner of the restaurant will cook for you if you give the ingredients and money. This meat is so precious, should I ask him? Absolutely. So Cheyenne went to the restaurant, but it was closed because it's a day off. There is no doubt that the sign says that today is a day off. Haku who can't just give up knocks on the door, and a clerk comes out, surprised. It's because there's a huge familiar outside the store. Excuse me, is Mr. Edvin here? Th. The manager is not here. Is today is his holiday? And, no, not like that. He hasn't come back since yesterday. He said he wants to collect ingredients in Orc Forest. Is it usual for him to not to come back for a while? When Cheyenne asked, the clerk shook his head with an uneasy look. The Orc Forest is not far from the town, and yesterday we collected some ingredients there too. The clerk also said that it was strange for him to take this long. I was wondering if I could ask an adventurer to search for him. There's someone fit for that. Hey, Cheyenne. Oh, if you're okay with us, we can search for him. We have something for him to cook after all. Yes, please. Please find the manager. Leave it to us. After hearing about the situation from the clerk, Cheyenne and Haku hurried to the Orc Forest. In contrast to the dark forest where he met Haku, there are many orcs as the name suggests. However, other monsters and animals are also on a wide variety, it is a place where there are quite a lot of people come and go because it is blessed with many ingredients. This place is so big. This is going to be troublesome. Give me that. Here it is. He takes out the clothes he has borrowed from the clerk, and Haku sniffs it and remembers the smell. Haku moves through the forest while sharpening his sense of smell. Hmm, it seems it's this way. Hmm, he went that deep? The mushroom he was looking for were growing around the entrance. He didn't have any unpleasant feeling. Haku stops as they move forward while watching and searching the surrounding scenery. Cheyenne already knew the reason. There's a big thick tree, and he feels a presence hiding behind it. It must be a monster that made him nervous. I'll do it. It's a great time to try out Saber, so he approached the tree and deliberately turned his back in front of it. Boo! Saw this as a chance, the pig-faced human-bodied orc attacks him. His body is more than two meters high, and he swings his club high. Cheyenne, without looking back, caught the club falling over his head with the back of his sword. Orcs are said to have a fairly high intellect among monsters. But the sword didn't move in the slightest, even though he hit it with all his might but he can't afford to think about it. As soon as Cheyenne pushed the club back, his hand was cut down from the elbow. Hmm, I can cut easily with this. And it can withstand an impact from Orc, this is a good weapon. Nodding with satisfaction, Cheyenne went to end this. Just as a snake is eating at its prey, he jumps and aiming to cut the Orc's neck with speed and precision. Wait. Wah. Cheyenne stopped his sword just before it touches the Orc's neck. He looks at his partner, asking him with his eyes what's with the unexpected stop. I can slightly smell Mr. Edvin's scent from that orc. What? Cheyenne steps back, put his sword in its sheath, and let go of the orc. The orc understood and immediately ran away dragging his body. If we follow him, will he guide us to where Mr. Edvin at? But, we need to follow him as quiet as possible. Then, I'll follow him first. And you will follow us using his scent. Can you do it? Sure can do. That pig scent is so strong. The forest is well shaded, so Cheyenne uses dark swimming to quickly move from shade to shade, eventually entering the shadow of the runaway orc. Even though the enemy is already far behind, he's still running for five minutes. Cross the creek, cross the bad scaffolding with the roots and stones of the tree, and finally go to the open place where the grass peeled off. There are trees around it but they are not in the central square, and instead a large number of orcs gathered in it. Cheyenne is a little surprised at the sight. Orcs often flock, it's not uncommon. The problem is that there are four, number five people near them. Then he moved to the shade of a tree where he could hide from the shadow of the escaped orcs. 
because it is a technique close to warp, no one will notice it. Well, what kind of situation is this? He decided to watch their movements first. Chapter 19 The dying orc came to the flock and made gestures as if he wants to convey something. It seems that the situation was able to get transmitted to his fellow orc whether it was a cry or a regular language, and the situation immediately became tense to the orc group. First, Cheyenne looks over to measure their strength. There are twenty orcs, and each one of them has a huge body and strong physique. Normal orc's color is usually pale, but there's one that is black-reddish. It also has black eyes, which made the person who sees them feel fear and an ominous impression towards them. Beside the strong-looking orc, there are five people. Judging from their muscles, they must be adventurers or mercenaries. They're half-naked, and their feet seem swollen. It seems to prevent them from escaping. In the center of the square, a fire is lit, so you can expect them to burn and eat the captured human beings. What is this, a festival? Flocks of orcs sometimes do this once in a while. Capture a few people, burn them alive, enjoy their screams, and then eat their meat happily with their friends. Cheyenne should be prioritizing saving those five people, but, black swimming, can only transport one, two at most, people at once. He's going to take his time, and avoid getting them killed. As if to help Cheyenne's situation, a swift stepping sound approached, so he went into its shadow. Can you hear me, Haku? It's me. Wow, you're in my shadow, right? There's a group of orcs, prisoners, and a strong individual in the square ahead. Can you disturb the others so I can save the prisoners? Roger that. They're just orcs, so I can just become a green fox with wind attribute. The snow-white hair of Haku slowly turned into green, and the wind coils around his body. Not only his appearance, his ability also changed and Cheyenne realized that Haku became much faster. Ah, so that's what you mean earlier. I'll leave them to you then. Fufufu, I've been entrusted. Woo woo. Haku charges into the flock with a roar to attract the orcs. Because he gathered their attention and hostility, Cheyenne can quietly emerge from the shadows of the prisoners. However, special individual orc was quite sensitive, and as soon as he discovered where Cheyenne was, he signaled to nearby subordinate and order him to attack. It's just a small fry utter Cheyenne while he jump lightly and slash the orc's forehead. Is Edvin among you guys? The, that's me. Thank God. Now, please stay there until the battle is over. Edvin is a man of about forty years old with a deep carved face, and a wound on his leg. Both hands that can be said to be the life of a cook are safe, so he feels relieved. Please be careful. His weapon is powerful. Cheyenne stretched his vision after being alerted, and his weapon does seem different than normal orcs. Made of iron, have ten centimeters width and sharp protrusions. Cheyenne knew this weapon. Double iron rod. Did he stole it from an adventurer? Magic weapons are ranked by alphabets from D, C, B, a. S. That one is C rank. It's not that uncommon of a weapon so it fits in C rank, but the destructive power is considerable. The stronger the arm strength of the owner, the higher the power. Kill. K-I-L-L-L. -L -L. Sean lowers his head to avoid the iron rod that swings right above it. Once the iron rod hit the ground, it gouged the ground spewing sand all over. Meaning that this weapon is a perfect fit for an orc. Orcs are powerful yet slow. But that doesn't apply to the special individuals. A person who fights it thinking it's just an orc is killed immediately because he moves around agilely with a huge body over three meters. Cheyenne touched his fingers on the sword blade and applied, black coating. The dull glow disappeared and it quickly turned into black sword. Every time the orc hits the ground like a mole tap game while screaming kill kill, Cheyenne moves swiftly to dodge it and slash its arm lightly while at it. Why no hit? Why no hit? It's because you're so easy to read. It's rough and there's no trace of martial arts there. Pointing that out, Cheyenne slashes the orc easily one more time and the orc can't move anymore. Because every time he received damage, instead of slashing damage his magic power was sucked by the black sword. Strong orc special individuals can be sold at a high price, right? Especially to the monster researchers. The purchase price is higher if managed to not damage it as much as possible. 
No longer able to hold his prideful double iron rod anymore, Cheyenne hits the orc's forehead, finishing the battle. Wow, the opponent that all of us can't defeat was ended just like that. Who are you? It was so overwhelming. To the prisoners who are astonished by his overwhelming strength, Cheyenne asks who is the owner of the iron rod. Because it seems nobody knows, he put it inside Dark Bag. Speaking of overwhelming, Haku is no different. Most of the orcs have already died after their bodies were cut in half. It's like a slash by the wind. In addition, there's high-level wind magic called Majestic, and because Haku always uses them, the orcs literally can't get close. Monsters who can only attack at close range are pushed back by the wind when attacking and falls on their butts, and another wind appear there and defeat them. It's so strong. Isn't it above the level of evil wind dragon that I once defeated? Cheyenne decides that Haku is the strongest monster that he has encountered so far. He knows that he's strong, but not to that extent. Moreover, there's still plenty of energy to spare. It seems that you've already finished. As expected. It's Haku's thing to not turn down the enemy. No no no, that would be you Cheyenne. By the way, those people. They're safe. Mr. Edvin is also there too. Oh Mr. Edvin, I would like to ask you a favor. Please grill our meat. It's a little interesting to see Haku asking for it even if he doesn't know who is Edvin yet, and the atmosphere at the place softens. Oi oi, you can eat, but you're gonna carry them. Ah, I see. Please get on my back, everyone. Fortunately, all the injuries are only legs, so he has them straddle Haku's back. Some of them are amazed by the fluffiness of Haku's hair. It's really better to recover the wound on their leg, but now there are no items. I can't use recovery magic. Me too. No problem. Once we get back in town, we can do something about it. Please take care of us for now. When I've gotten better, I will grill that meat. I will get you there safely, even if it costs me my life. Responding excitedly to Edvin, Haku starts moving. There were injured people, but Cheyenne and his people arrived at Oregon without any problems. They parted with others, and immediately go to treat Edvin's injuries. Cheyenne had an expensive potion back at the inn. When he was injured, it took about thirty minutes to heal to the point where the wound closes and he could move. Cheyenne heard that preparation is necessary, so he decided to have the food served the next day. The next day, Cheyenne and Haku waited excitedly for the food. By the way, it's free. Because Edvin said, how could I take payments from you? Here you go. Steamed boar meat and boat and nabe. 1. Gulp. The aromatic smoke drifting from the pot made them can't hold their mouth any longer, and they start to eat before saying it at a kamasu, too. And it seems that Haku can eat hot food just fine. They start with eating a hot pot filled with shiitake mushrooms, carrots, and Chinese cabbage. The thinly sliced boar meat has no foul smell at all, and Cheyenne is impressed by its tenderness. Even though the meat usually smells and hard to eat. I can take the smell, but the tenderness, wow! The steamed meat is also delicious, it's so tasty it feels like a food from another world. This one is also good. Nodding, Cheyenne takes another piece of the steamed boar meat. He was so excited he takes another four thick slices. Phew! This one is also really tasty. It's the best. Ha ha ha, I've made enough for you. Especially for your familiar. 3. H.I.A. Fuu. The appearance of Haku who blew away reason and was absorbed in the food was wild itself. Looking so happy, Cheyenne decided to just watch with a smile, didn't speak out until he had finished eating. Chapter 20. Tomb of the Divine Eye. Located north of Oregon, it is said that it's a place where the predecessor of the Hero of Divine Eyes slumber. A huge and majestic temple dedicated to the tombs has been built on a vast land, resulting so many tourists come and go to the temple, which instigated the building of a small village beside it. Cheyenne and Haku came to the village for a certain reason. Feel anything? Yes, it certainly was here. Well then, let's go all out to search it. Yeah, it's important to regain back my power after all. The thing that Cheyenne search is the fragments of demonic robbing stone that have been scattered all over the world. 
he didn't actually know where, but he can feel where it approximately is, because it's his own magic. The village road is big enough for Haku to walk around. Shayan thinks that this is a nice village. The bazaar has started, and there are many people who sell things and perform various arts to tourists. Shayan, Shayan. That's alligator meat. I have never eaten one before. Ha, ah, you want to eat it, right? We have money, so go on. This is why I love you, Shayan sama Shayan challenged himself to try eating alligator meat, right beside Haku who's clearly enjoying the meat. The meat looks like chicken tender but it's chewier, especially the tail part. It was so elastic. Only people with strong jaws, if not as strong as Haku, can handle it. As they walked around shopping, Shayan made eye contact with a thin, sharp-eyed merchant. Hmm, what if? Is it him? Maybe. Shayan speaks to a street vendors who spread a cloth and sells various stones and ornaments. Where did you find this stone? It fell into a rocky area near this village. Shayan is convinced after hearing the answer. It's definitely the demonic robbing stone. How much is it? Please, don't be higher than ten million, Shayan prays from the bottom of his heart. But? Twenty million gown. I, isn't it too expensive? He he, I'm good at judging, you know? This stone is filled with a huge amount of magic, you know? To the point that if someone said it's filled with the demon lord's magic, I will believe it. Can you please lower it a little? How about ten million? Sorry laddie, but I'm being generous with twenty million, you know? There won't be any more negotiations if he's that stubborn. In the first place, Cheyenne is not good with these things. Cheyenne turns his back and decided to save some money before coming back. But, Haku tries a different approach. He's quite persistent. Hey how about we barter it with my fur? Ho oh, he's not a normal familiar it seems. Yes. I'm a white fox, a mutated version of the fox monster. As I thought. It's rare indeed. Fox demons fur and pelts are the most expensive among the other materials. It was also famous for becoming a medium during magic tool creation and alchemy. Because each hair contains magic, it is different from a normal fox. Haku didn't have to explain it, and the merchant knew it, so the conversation proceeds quite fast. But. It's still not enough. NGH, how stubborn. How about my fur plus money? Hmm, okay. Your hair plus five million gowns, and I'll trade it. If it's that much, you can pay, right? Yes. I can. So, shall we shake on it? It was decided to exchange it for the stone in this way, but Cheyenne's heart feels a little tingle when Haku's soft hair was cut, even though it's just a little. When he gets the stone and goes out of the village, he says with a sunken expression. Hey, is it alright? Losing your magical power means that you lose some of your powers too. It's just a small bit, and it's just temporary. The fur will grow again, don't worry. I'm sorry. It's always you who helped me, Haku. If I'm in trouble, you'll do the same. And, I'm indebted to you after all. Food and others, foo foo foo. Shayan laughs and decided to finally recover his power from the demonic robbing stone. The mechanism is simple, if he destroys the stone and lets it touch the skin immediately, it will be absorbed immediately because it is his magic power. Right after he did it, Shayan immediately feels a surge of power inside his body. He feels as if his power doubled. I wanna test it, like right now. Well then, let's kill some monsters. Hop on my back. If you leave the village and run through the basin, you will easily meet about one or two demons. Today the sunlight is so strong, and they found three lizard men behind a rock wall, trying to shade themselves from the sunlight. They also called Lizard Man, and is a demon of a heinous nature that attacks human without questioning or answering. They are famous for skillfully handling weapons and armor taken from humans, and these three demons also have weapons in their hands. When Cheyenne comes down from the Haku, he quickly activates wine magic to the oncoming Lizard Man. Wind, dance. An innumerable blade of wind appeared and the lizard men were cut without any resistance. After about 20 minutes of prepping, the lizard men have become finely chopped meat. Hayek it's not dark magic but it can do that? Can I call you a monster? 
What? Even though you have a much powerful wind attack? No, 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 mine was like a breeze wind. On the other hand, yours is more like a storm, Cheyenne. To the point that the lizard men can't even scream. Well, it's a bad monster, so it's good. My power has somewhat recovered. Let's test it a little more, and then go back to Oregon. Okay. After seeing how far his powers have returned, including dark magic, Cheyenne returned to Oregon Inn. At dinner, Cheyenne asks the shopkeeper to bring all the dishes he has today. There's something I want you to do. I'd like to put a year's meal's worth in Haku's stomach. Wait, wait. Doesn't that make me look like a stupid fox who's always hungry? It's okay, Haku. Eat as much as you want today. It's a celebration for me regaining my power. Well then. If it's a celebration. On this evening, the shopkeeper cooked more than he ever did in the past, and 90% of it ends up in Haku's belly. By the time it was an hour after the meal, there's a figure of Haku sleeping with a happy face in the room. H-R-R-R-N-G-G-H, I can't eat more than this but desserts enter a different belly. Trying his best to hold his laughter, Cheyenne left the room without making any sound. When he gets down to the first floor, he asks the shopkeeper. If I didn't come back by morning, give this to Haku. He gave him a letter and five million gowns. The shopkeeper seems like he wants to say something, but he nodded silently in front of Cheyenne's determined expression. The world outside is dominated by night, and it gives Cheyenne more power than daytime. However, he still needs the power to fuel his determination. Because, he's going to face the hero of Divine Eye, after all. He thought that if his strength returned, he would definitely have to meet and listen to their excuses. Setting things aside like monitoring him, they won't get away after helping Chains of Death God. But it's not going to only become a conversation. Cheyenne inhales deeply, trying to feel the magic in the city with his recently regained dark magic. Because, by following the flow of the biggest magic, there's a high chance that there's a hero there. However, just before using magic, a wind shook Cheyenne's hair. Well, ain't this pleasant. Haku, why? Behind him was someone who should be sleeping in the inn right now, Haku. Cheyenne has a strong sense of justice, after all. Once you regain your power, I have a feeling you will do it. It is almost certain that a hero is involved in the robbing case. You can see through anything, huh? I'm ashamed. The least you can do is invite me. We're partners, right? With words that stabbed him deep in his chest, Cheyenne endured the overflowing emotions and calmly leaned his back to Haku's gentle torso. Haku. Let's go, together. Heh, I'll accompany you. With an unprecedented sense of versatility, Cheyenne used his dark magic, 